Okay, uh, hello everyone. Welcome to the next lecture of our course. Before we start um, cutting edge research presentation, I'd like to make a couple of announcements. First is that uh, the material that we are going to cover today is not uh, in the exam. So you can enjoy without the stress. And uh, you can also fill, fill out uh, course evaluations until tomorrow. So please try to be constructive. If you haven't filled it, uh, please do that. And also be, there will be a discussion session tomorrow that we are going to solve uh, sample exam questions here. So enjoy. you can come here and we will solve and ask your questions. That would be good to basically that you can be prepared for the exam. So the first presentation is uh, Geraldo is going to talk about Google Neural Network models. So Geraldo is a happy PhD student in Safari Research Group. And uh, yeah, Geraldo, feel free to start. Thanks, Mohammed. Um, so today I'm going to give uh, two talks about proxy memory, accelerators for proxy memory for different applications. And the first domain that I'm going to talk about is inference for neural networks, specifically on edge. And the second one that I'm going to talk about is going to be databases. So this is a good, uh, these two lectures are a good um, uh, framework to see how you can take application, uh, profile understand these bottlenecks, and then design a uh, process memory suitable uh, accelerator for them. So uh, this first one, as uh, Mohammed said, this is called Google Neural Network Models for Edge, de uh, edge Devices, Analyzing and Mitigating Machine Learning uh, Inference Bottlenecks. Uh, this paper was uh, published in PEC 2021. Uh, if you want to ask any question during the presentation, feel free to stop me. And I'm going to try to answer this as much as I can. Okay, so before we start, just a quick executive summary of what this paper is about. So just to give some context. So uh, this particular paper, we went to Google and then we, we took some of the machine learning models, your network models that the Google, were use, Google was using to doing their, to doing their product, like for, for speech recognition or translation or image recognition. And in total 24 of those models, and then we profile them to understand what are the major bottlenecks that the baseline accelerator, the Google HTTP accelerator were something from when it's executing those models. So after our analysis, we saw that uh, there was three, three main problems that the edge TPU accelerator was suffering from when accelerating those 24 different ML models. Uh, the first one is that it was operating below its peak throughput. The second one that the accelerator was operating below its theoretical energy efficiency metric. And the third one was that his memory hierarchy is quite inefficient. So the key insight that we got from this analysis is that the main problem that the Google HTPU was suffering from was that it's a single design, it's a monolithic accelerator that was trying to that was trying to accelerate different neural network models from which each one of those neural network models, and not only that, each neural network layer inside a model can have different properties, which may or may not benefit from the design of the monolithic accelerator. So to solve this problem, we design a framework called Mensa. And Mensa consists of a collection of heterogeneous accelerators that have been catered for a particular properties of a neural network layer. So with this, we can design a data flow and the other accelerator design that can minimize the area cost of the overall accelerator and at the same time, improving overall throughput performance and memory, memory efficiency. We evaluate Mensa uh, with those 24 Google HTTP uh, models. And then we see that uh, Mensa improves performance and energy by three times in 3.1 times on average compared to the baseline Google HTTP accelerator. And also Mensa can provide reduced costs and area efficiency compared to the baseline accelerator. So this is just a summary of what I'm going to talk about. And this is the outline of this talk. So first I'm going to briefly introduce uh, what we are talking about here, why it's important to use uh, an edge, uh, to do edge inference um, and the Google HTTP accelerator. Uh, then we are going to present our, the characterization that we did at Google uh, for the HTTP and the models, the 24 different neural network models. 
Then I'm going to present the Mesa framework. Then the a realization of the Mesa framework for the Google TPU models called Mesa G, then the evaluation and conclusion. So we start with the introduction. So why do you want to do machine learning inference in the edge, right? Or neural network inference in the edge? Because it's, it provides some uh, benefits in terms of privacy. So you don't go to the cloud to do some inference. You keep it local. Uh, connectivity, you don't need to have Wi-Fi or have internet around to do some inference job. Uh, latency, again, you're not going to a, to a network, so your latency can be much, much, much shorter. And also bandwidth, because again, you're local, you can have much higher throughput. Uh, however, if you try to do... Uh, neural network inference in a baseline CPU uh, in edge devices, you are going to uh, hit some problems because as we know, edge device like your phone or your, or your tablet, for example, it has limit power budget and also limit computer resources that are not tailored or catered to uh, doing neural network inference. So to solve this problem, uh, many companies right now have started introducing neural network accelerators in their edge devices, specifically to do neural network inference. So those accelerators are tailored to minimize the power, the power consumption of doing neural network inference and also have the specific resources, resources required to do neural network inference on the edge. And here I have two examples, for example, the Apple Neural Engine in the i12, um, these current Apple chips, and also the Google Edge CPU, which is, if I'm not mistaken, is now in version four or five, uh, uh, but is, is another good example, but it also goes from other companies as well. So, the, at the same time that we are seeing different neural network inference uh, accelerators being uh, uh, available in edge devices, we also have a variety of models that are coming along these days for different tasks. So, for example, we have uh, models that are tailored for speech recognition, models that are tailored for language translation, image captioning, face detection. Now we have these uh, adversarial neural networks that is quite common, is quite popular in chat GDP. Um, and also the, the, the one that does image processing. So there is a, every day there is a new different neural network model that is coming across that try to solve a different problem. However, now you have a challenge because you have a single accelerator design that is in your edge, in your phone or in your tablet that needs to accelerate this variety of neural network models, which I'm, as I'm going to show next have different properties. And, and not, not always you, uh, the design of the accelerator is going to benefit all of those uh, and, uh, models equally. So we, with this premise, we start analyzing what are the challenges that when you try to accelerate very neural network models in a single accelerator, uh, what the challenge is going to arrive in that, in that case. So just as a, a background, uh, yeah, the HCPU accelerator, it follows a, 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 a similar structure as all the other accelerators, for example, the Apple one uh, for neural network inference. So I'm going to briefly generalize how they are. Um, but they may, may vary here and there in a specific design. But in general, it's much, pretty much the same. So uh, it starts with the ML model being stored in DRAM. And then the model is fetched from DRAM layer by layer. So each layer is going to include both input activation and parameters, or uh, which both are pre-trained weights and they put data for that particular inference. And it's going to output some output activation. So the, at a high level, the accelerator uh, is a systolic array, which has a processing element array uh, of multiply and accumulate units uh, connected to some sort of on-chip buffer that is going to be used during the computation for both storing parameter and activations and also to store intermediate data. So in this case here in the baseline HTPU that we are going to assume next, or a peer processing element array has 64 as a matrix of 64 by 64 uh, MAC units, multiply accumulated units, which can reach two teraflops per second. And we have four megabytes of on-chip buffer. Uh, so there is also a data flow, which is going to be statically defined, is going to statically define how the input and activations are going to be placed uh, and going to flow throughout the processing element arrays during the execution of a neural network inference. 
So, uh, yeah, as I said, we went to Google and then we took 24 of the different edge neural network models that were running in this Google Edge TPU accelerator. And specifically, they, they were six uh, recurrent neural network and transducers that are used, for example, for speech recognition, uh, 13 convolution neural networks that are used, for example, for face, uh, face detection, uh, two LSTMs, uh, long short term memories uh, networks that are used for language translation and three rec uh, recurrent uh, convolution neural networks which are used for image capturing, for example. So we took those uh, workloads and then we, uh, we run them in the Google HTPU and then we profiled them and did some analysis. And we saw that the accelerator uh, suffered from three uh, main, main challenges when accelerating those 24 models. So the first one is that it operates significantly below its peak uh, throughput. The second one is that it operates below, significantly below its peak energy efficiency. And the third one is that it handles memory, uh, memory access quite inefficiently. I'm going to show some data to, sh uh, to show how we come up with those three challenges or observe those three challenges when running the, those models. It's starting with the, uh, the first problem, the low peak uh, computation throughput. So we find the overall, when you run those models, the accelerator operates significantly below its peak throughput across all of the models. So here is an example of how you can observe that the application operates below its peak throughput. What I'm showing here in this plot is what we call a roof line model. The roof line model is a simple model that can be used to classify if an application is in a particular system. It's either compute bound or memory bound. So it's bound by computer resources or by memory resources. So this plot here in the in the x-axis, we have the, the arithmetic intensity that the application is going to get or going to achieve, in this case here, in calculated in floats per byte. So how many float operations you do by each byte that you access from the memory. And then y access, you have the throughput in, of the particular application in teraflops per second, for example. And then you have two lines. One of the lines uh, is called the memory roof. And uh, this, is, this line is calculated by the uh, arithmetic intensity times the bandwidth of your, the maximum bandwidth of your main memory in your system. And then you have a, mem a compute roof that is given by the peak compute throughput that your, your accelerator can provide. So in this case, two teraflops per second, as I said before. So uh, just out of, out of curiosity, if application lies be be below uh, the memory curve here, that, is, uh, that the, this horizontal line, that this, uh, this, this uh, bandwidth times arithmetic intensity line, we say this application is memory bound. And if it's below the compute uh, line, the compute bound line, and they say the application is compute bound. So here, basically, I'm plotting different the 24 different neural network models in this model in this roofline model here, and and we are going to draw some conclusions. So the first one is that there are some models. For example, those models are usually compute bound models because uh, they are below the compute line, uh, the memory roof here, and those are, uh, for example, LSTMs and transducers. And for those models, they are memory bound. The accelerator can offer, the, the application only takes about 1% of the peak throughput that the accelerator provides. So you have a huge amount of underutilization. Uh, and when you look at compute bound models, for example, convolution neural networks, uh, even them, even though they are compute bound, they can still take only half of the peak throughput of the accelerator. So again, the accelerator uh, is not being fully utilized. Uh, then we do the same analysis for energy efficiency. And we have a similar plot here. Uh, the same idea is a roofline model for energy now. Uh, you have float uh, arithmetic intensity in the x-axis, in, in the energy efficiency in teraflops per joule in the y-axis. The line is a bit different because energy, you always spend some energy in the system because you have a static energy. So there is no um, knee in the plot here. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a more constant curve. Uh, but anyway, the idea is the same. And then uh, in the peak energy efficiency of our accelerator is of 1.42 teraflops per joule. And then we can observe similar things. We see that for the memory bound uh, models, uh, you have really low energy efficiency. And even for the compute bound models, uh, the energy efficiency is only half of what the accelerator can provide. And then if you dig deeper, what, uh, or what is the problem that you are not reaching to energy efficiency or of, of, of throughput efficiency? Uh, we see that overall, 
there is a huge cost of moving data around this accelerator. So here I have different, layer, different models again in the x-axis, and now in the y-axis I have the energy efficiency uh, of the of the, sorry the consumed energy for each operation in the accelerator. So the energy of the processing element array, the of chip interconnect, uh, the connection, the DRAM, access DRAM, access the parameter buffer, the activation buffer, and the static energy. And as you can see here, 46 by or and 31 percent of the total energy of some of those mod or some of those models goes to accessing of chip parameter uh, of chip parameters and also distributing those parameters across the processing element arrays. So overall, uh, to summarize again, the main challenge that we saw in the UHTP when and when uh, accelerating those 24 models is that it operates significantly below its peak throughput. And it also it operates significantly below its peak energy efficiency, and it handles memory access quite inefficiently. So the question now is where those challenges are coming from? And to answer this, now you're going to analyze the models themselves, not necessarily the accelerator, but trying to characterize the application. So we did that, and then we saw that uh, the first insight that we got was that the, there is a huge diversity uh, across the models in terms of properties of the models and also layers inside the model. So for example, here, uh, I have a scatter plot that I'm plotting the x-axis, the parameter footprint in megabytes, so the size of the parameters of a model, and also the arithmetic intensity in flops per byte of the model. And then here I have some models that are both compute bound and the LSTM is memory bound. So as you can see here, layers that are uh, uh, memory bound like LSTMs and transducers, they have really low reuse in terms of float provides, or they have really low, low intensity, arithmetic intensity, but at the same time, their parameter for print is quite large. While uh, layers that are more compute bound have lower parameter footprint, but at the same time, they have a high uh, flows per byte, uh, arithmetic intensity. And then when you look inside the model itself, you also see a large variety across the properties between each layer inside the model. So here, for example, I'm breaking down uh, some CNN model uh, and the x-axis, I have the, the layers, the, uh, the, index, the index of each layer, this neural network model. And then the y-axis, I have the number of multiply and accumulate operations in, in millions that uh, each layer executes. And as you can see, there is a huge variation in max intensity from across of up to 200 times across different layers inside the same model. And if you look at another metric, for example, as flows per byte or metric intensity, you also see this variation across different layers of the same model, up to 245 variation in flows per byte across uh, the layers. So uh, then we conclude that the root cause that the Google Edge TPU uh, was suffering uh, for to provide high throughput and low energy efficiency is that the model itself, the Google, uh, Google HTPU accelerator is completely oblivious about the heterogeneities that exist in each model, both across models and inside uh, the model itself. So since the Google HTPU is a monolithic accelerator, is a single accelerator that is trying to accelerate many different network models with different properties, uh, it, when you design this accelerator, you have to over provision for the size of the processing, processing element array, the amount of on-chip buffer that you're going to have, and also you're going to have a rich data flow and fixed uh, memory bandwidth for that given accelerator. And that is, not, uh, is obviously not optimal when you have heterogeneity uh, play into, uh, put into account. Um, and then this is the what we are going to try to solve next with Mensa. Uh, now uh, I'm going to talk about our solution to solve this problem. Is there any question so far? Okay, good. Um, so our goal is to basically to provide a, uh, some framework to design neural network accelerators that can cater for di arrive, uh, different models and with different properties, and also for different layers with, with different properties inside the model itself. So our main idea is instead of running a single monolithic accelerator, we are going to provide uh, different accelerators. We are going to provide different neural network accelerators with custom data flows and also custom uh, processing element arrays uh, and, and buffers that would cater for the properties of a single layer uh, doing the execution of the, the inference of the accelerator. 
So just a like high level overview how this operates. So when you have the baseline accelerator here, we have a single monolithic accelerator for different models. When you have Mensa, we are going to have different models and different accelerators. And, and during the execution time, we are going to take the layers of each one of those of each one of those models and place them in the, in the different accelerators uh, that makes more sense uh, that based on some properties of the of the layers themselves. And here I have introduced the concept of families. We are going to see next that you could ask, oh, now you're going to have one edge to accelerate one accelerator per model. So you're going to have 24 accelerators. Uh, it's not the case. We saw in our analysis, and I'm going to show next that in general, you can group the, the properties of the layers of us of the varying uh, models into families or we have similar properties. So you only design accelerator, custom accelerators for uh, the, the, the families of layers rather to each layer of, with a particular distinct property. Uh, and the key to make this all work is to have a scheduler, right? That is going to map uh, based on some particular property of a layer is going to map the execution of that layer to the more appropriate hardware accelerator during the execution. So uh, the model that the, the scalar that you propose in this paper is quite simple, is a, is, a, is a greedy heuristics that works as follows. So uh, we have as input of the scalar, the neural network model, and also the properties of the accelerator and that you have uh, available in your system and the characteristics of each one of the layers. And all of these informations are, 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 um, are available uh, to the scheduler doing the compilation because the, uh, the, the model itself is quite well behaved. So there is no much uh, dynamic properties here. Uh, the only dynamic property that you have is the inputs of the, of, the, of, the, of the model. So the image that you are scanning or something, but the model itself and, and the activations uh, I'm sorry, and the weights are already defined uh, prior is a static information. So uh, as I said, the layer characteristics tends to group into a small number of, 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 of families. And also each one of the accelerators are going to cater for one of those families. And then, um, and then what is going to happen is uh, the scheduler is going to take each one of those layers uh, prior to the execution and is going to, and, and these properties that was inferred to the accelerator before, and it's going to tell, oh, one layer, uh, for each layer, which one of these, uh, which one of the accelerators this particular layer should execute. Uh, I'm not going to enter into details how this works. Um, basically, there is a cost model that defines because there you can have communication across the, the layers uh, inside the model, right? So there is a cost model that tells you uh, if it's better to execute a layer in a particular accelerator, depending on how much traffic the layer is going to generate next, or if it's better for you to execute a particular layer in a suboptimal accelerator, so you minimize the traffic of the of, of the data uh, across the execution of the model. And for that, I invite you to check our paper. Uh, is there any question? Okay, so now I'm going to show how we employ this Mensa framework for the 24 neural network models uh, from Google. And, and then we propose our, uh, our new accelerator that is called Mensa G. So the first thing is, is, how, is to answer how many models, how many accelerators we need, right? And, and as I said, the number of accelerators is going to be dictated by the number of families of how many groups we have uh, with these distinct properties for uh, each one of those layers. And the key observation that to make is that the layers tend to group into uh, family layers, right? So here I have uh, some graphs, there's some scattered graphs, graphs and some models and, and some metrics. And there are some metrics that are more prone to impact the design of the accelerators. And we come up with those metrics uh, being the parameter footprints, the number of multiply and accumulations that you do, and the arithmetic and the reuse, the arithmetic intensity that you have for float, float provides. And here, each point is a different layer from a neural network model. And as you can see here, uh, when you plot them uh, in this scatter plot, you see here uh, that uh, it, some gr some groups being formed. Uh, here specifically family one and two in those two, uh, which has the, the main characteristics having low parameter footprint and high data reuse, uh, 
Uh, so low parameter footprints, high data reuse, and also high uh, multiplying cumulative intensity, MAC intensity. And as if you remember from the previous plots, uh, we see that those layers actually are compute centric layers. So they would benefit from accelerator that not necessarily have high amounts of bandwidth or because not memory bound, but would have larger number of processing element arrays because they are more compute bound. And we call those layers, families one and two, uh, compute centric layers. Then we have the other layers which have lower MAC intensity, higher parameter footprint size, and low data reuse or float or metric intensity. And we call those layers uh, data centric layers. So, based on that, we are going to propose three accelerators. Uh, I'm going to explain why three later on, uh, even though there is only majorly two families. Uh, but we are going to propose three accelerators. Those accelerators are uh, Pascal, uh, Pavlov, and Jackpot. And I'm going to present each one of them uh, next. So before, I just want to say that uh, since some of the accelerators uh, would benefit from uh, have a high memory uh, requirements, uh, we are going to place them inside the logic layer of a 3D stack memory. So in the end, we have a heterogeneous system that we have compute centric accelerators placed at the baseline at the CPU or in the SOC. And then you have memory centric accelerators that are using processing memory uh, capabilities of 3D stack memories. So let's go accelerator by accelerator now and see what they do. So the first accelerator is called Pascal. Pascal is a compute centric accelerator caters for the families in family layers one and two. So uh, since uh, families in uh, layers in families one and two have high MAC uh, intensity, if you remember from the previous plots, they would benefit from a larger processing element array. And then we empirically select a size of, of a processing element array of 32 by 32. So we have, um, uh, uh, that number of um, multiply and accumulate units. And uh, we saw that this empirically, we saw that this is enough to provide high throughput utilization for the, the layers in families one and two. Uh, at the same time, we see because they don't have high, that's also families that don't have high parameter footprint that we can, and, and also uh, low activation buffer requirement, we can reduce the size of the on chip buffers of the activate buffer and the parameter buffer compared to the baseline HTTP accelerator by 32 times and eight times. And, um, and as I said, this is a on chip accelerator. Um, so it's not going to be used process memory capabilities. The next one is Pavlov. Uh, Pavlov is Keter is a memory is a is a data centric accelerator. Uh, however, we saw in your analysis that LSTMs have a, a have a specific uh, it has specific characteristics that distinguish it from the other memory centric layers, which is that it has really low um, multiply and accumulate requirements. So my, the major we do really few multiply and accumulates per byte that access. So based on that, you don't actually need. Uh, a really large processing, uh, uh, processing element array. So our array is only of eight by eight, uh, which gives enough throughput to, to, to fully accelerate those, those uh, LSTM uh, layers. Again, we reduce the size of the activation buffer because, um, because of the number of the amount of reuse the accelerator provides. And then we remove completely the parameter buffer from the accelerator because the, LSTMs has really low amount of, of, of data reuse. And since we are placing the accelerator inside the 3D stack of uh, 3D stack uh, memory, and we can have higher bandwidth, it's much more beneficial to directly stream those parameters from the RAM at higher bandwidth and lower latency than uh, having a buffer inside the accelerator that would buffer some, uh, some data for a really brief amount of time. And then later on, you have to go and fetch the data again from DRAM. So based on that, we completely remove the parameter buffer. Uh, and as I said, this is a near data accelerator. And then finally, we have Jacquard. Jacquard is going to be catered for the non-LSTM data centric layers. Those layers have a little bit more MAC utilization than the LSTMs. So because of that, we design a processing element array that is light larger than the previous one. Uh, we also reduce the size of the activation buffer and the parameter buffers as well compared to the baseline HTPU. And this is also our new data accelerator. So this is all of those three accelerators that we are uh, proposing uh, in, in Mensagy. And if you want more details about the data flow of each one of those accelerators that allows us to, for example, reduce the size of the activation buffer, I invite you to check our paper. 
So finally, uh, we are heading to evaluation. So uh, all of what we did was based on simulation, uh, in the internal cyclic rate simulator that was used inside Google. And we compare the accelerator to the baseline, oops, the baseline HTPU accelerator, the one that they presented in the backup slide, in the background slides. Uh, the may same baseline Google HTTP accelerator now equipped with a high bandwidth of chip memory uh, and also our message uh, accelerator. There is one data point that I did I remove here for uh, that is in the paper, which is a comparison of Mesa also with a uh, with a heterogeneous accelerator from uh, from Pry Walk that is called Iris uh, version two version two. So uh, here in this plot, uh, we have the normalized energy uh, consumed. Uh, the, num the normalized values are to the baseline HTTP accelerator, break down into each one of the components of the accelerator. So the static energy, the process elementary energy, the dynamic energy of keeping core connects, buffers. Um, and based on that, we, and in the x-axis, we have some of the layers. Uh, I, this is a summary of what we have, because in the paper, we have 24 of those layers, so the plots will just be too large. But this is representative across all of those classes. So uh, I'm going to draw some of um, some conclusions based on this plot. The first one being that C, uh, uh, message is going to lower the number the the on chip and off chip traffic by 15.3 uh, times uh, by properly scheduling uh, layers to the accelerate with the most appropriate data flow and also memory bandwidth. And also, we are going to reduce the dynamic energy of on chip buffers and the knock of the accelerator by almost 50 times compared to the baseline uh, HTTP accelerator with high bandwidth memory uh, by avoiding the over provision of the, of the size of the, of the processing element arrays and the size of the on chip buffers. So overall, message improved the energy efficiency of compared to the baseline HTTP by three times. And then you have the throughput analysis as well. And this, again, is just a summary. Uh, in the x-axis have the different um, as, uh, models. In the y-axis have the normalized throughput. Values are normalized to the baseline Google HTTP accelerator. And then we see that MSG improves throughput by 3.1 times compared to the baseline uh, accelerator. So we have way more things in the paper that I couldn't, I didn't have time to co cover over here about, for example, the details about the runtime scheduler, uh, details about the data flows of each one of the accelerators, the energy comparison with the Iris uh, versions two, and also uh, some utilization results for our, our proposed accelerator. Yeah, and also the inference latest, of course. Uh, and all of that is in your paper. So before I conclude, is there any question? Okay, so in conclusion, what you, the problem that you are trying to, to solve here in this paper is that even though edge accelerators are becoming quite common in, in, for neural network inference uh, in, in cell phones or tablets, uh, there is also a variety of accelerators being, a variety of neural network models that are being showing off today for different purposes. And then we analyze those models in these accelerators and we see that they suffer from uh, low peak throughput, low energy efficiency, and inefficient memory accesses. And then uh, or the key insight that we have is that the, the monolithic design of this uh, HTTP accelerator or this uh, edge accelerator for neural network inference uh, causes the design to not account for the heterogeneity within a model and across different models that need to execute in this single accelerator. And to solve this problem, we propose Mensa, which is a framework to design heterogeneous accelerators that would cater for the particular properties of each one of the layers. And then you see that it outperforms both uh, in terms of energy and performance, the baseline Google HTTP accelerator, at the same time providing lower uh, cost and area um, uh, overall compared to the baseline accelerator. And this is pretty much uh, the paper. Any questions, Zoom and Google? Yeah? If it can be applied to training, not exactly this accelerator, because training has different properties that inference uh, is way more compute intensity, for example. But definitely different. Uh, if you train different models, it would also require um, 
it would also lead to different properties. So a similar approach. So what you are actually trying to convey here is they need to have a different approach to design these accelerators, uh, being um, way more specific to the particular characteristics of the model. So you can apply the same idea of, uh, of, of, of or the same approach here to design a, a, a accelerator that is tailored for training for different models as well, since they have also different properties. But the same accelerator that you're proposing means a G would not be tailored for training because training is a different problem than inference. Any other question? Okay, and I'm oh, way behind. There oh, wait, there, there, there are a bunch of questions online, so someone should really handle them. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> You should tell. Yeah, should please tell me. Okay, I, th I thought I thought Constantinos or someone was handling them, but I can I can I'll I'll handle it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Liana has a question. Liana, do you want to ask it, uh, like in person? Uh, I can ask it. Sure. <laughs> um, sorry. Yeah, so I was wondering if an accelerator can run several ML models at once, like how a processor would run several loads. And like, is the scheduling done differently than a traditional processor would be? I didn't, the, your audio was not so, so so good for us here, but I guess the oh, question is sorry. how, sorry? No, I, I my question, sorry. I think I understood that if the, if the scheduling is different from a CPU scheduling, was that the question? Let me try without my headphones. Is this better? Oh, it's so much better. Thanks. <laughs> okay, great. Um, my question was, if the accelerator can run several models at once, um, similar to how a normal processor would do it, and is the scheduling done differently? Yeah, okay. So in, in our evaluation, we don't consider the case that uh, we have two models running concurrently in the different uh, in the in the in the accelerator, like of course in different uh, different one of the the three of them. But it could uh, just need to the, the the scheduler would just have to 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 would not even to have to deal with concurrence because the models are that they don't have concurrency access between them. Uh, they they would just, the scheduler would just have to 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 keep the state of each one of the of those models, but we don't necessarily uh, evaluate that in the paper. And what was the second part of the question? Sorry, I forgot. I was asking whether scheduling is done differently at all. Ah, okay. Different than the... Like with regards to multiple models being run. Ah, okay. Yeah, they, as I said, yeah, the scheduler would just, uh, would have to take into account that this larger pool, um, but it shouldn't be so much of a different problem because, as I said, uh, uh, usually different models don't share data, uh, so there's no like coherence or consistent problems. Uh, but then, and the the only problem, the, the only thing that the scheduler would take into account is that if there is a single time that at a given time uh, there is two layers that can concurrently execute in accelerator X, which one of those three that I propose, and uh, what you do, you scatter them to the best accelerator. Or you scatter the one, or you pick randomly one, or based on some metric, fairness metric, you take the other uh, one of those layers and you execute in a suboptimal accelerator, which is something that the scheduler already partially taken into account for this uh, in the case of communication across the models. And so the same idea could be applied also in the case that you have uh, uh, different models uh, trying to execute uh, concurrently the same accelerator. So, gotcha. Okay, that's exactly what I was wondering about. Thank you. You're welcome. Constantino's microphone is not working. Does it introduce a significant performance loss? When we introduce this men's scheduler, that's a question from YouTube. Okay, no, it does not introduce any performance loss um, because the scheduling decisions are not done 
um, so they, it, it's a runtime component, but it's a software runtime decision actually. So uh, usually the compiler, uh, uh, the view of a compiler for neural network models is a bit different from a compiler that would see from uh, uh, your like your regular DCC application because it also has some it it, it defines uh, the order the compiler decides with the orders that the, the execution of a particular uh, computation is going to be done doing your network inference uh, for the accelerator itself. So it, it's a, what we have here is not a, that is not a hardware runtime, a hardware scheduler, uh, is a software scheduler. So there is no actually uh, hardware overhead of going through a hardware unit some that is in the critical path that would be add this, uh, this, this, air, this latency would be add on top of the inference, so this is decided prior uh, during the, the prior to the prior to the execution of the of the inference itself in the accelerator. So no, there is no uh, overhead of the runtime scheduler in the inference process itself. There is one more question. We cannot really understand. So I will ask it, and if you can understand it, you can answer it. So Mensa G, is there a scalar measure how orthogonal certain sub-accelerators are, or is the design to space to non-linear for orthogonality to make sense? I don't fully understand the question, sorry, but I'm going to say what the scalar maybe, does. Maybe the question is around like whether the accelerators are totally orthogonal to each other, or like Maybe there's an overlap in the design space. Okay. Like so uh, they, there is some overlapping in their terms of uh, the on the on the data centric ones because we have two accelerator for data centric uh, layers. Uh, but when you specify based on the further characteristics, you see that they differentiate themselves, right? So the accelerator, the scheduler can indeed uh, do make a decision that you are going to take a layer and accelerate it in, 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 in execute it in a accelerator that is optimal for that particular scheduler, for that particular uh, uh, layer itself, uh, but basically based on com uh, communication traffic uh, across the layers inside the model. Uh, and we acknowledge that in the paper, that our scheduler is not optimal. It's a great heuristics that we come up with for this message. So probably there are better schedulers that can be proposed that could even further improve the, the, the energy efficiency and throughput of the message accelerator itself. Okay, any more questions? Yeah. Okay, I can repeat okay. it. Um, I, I want to ask, can this model ac accelerate like uh, models like transformer? Because uh, in the paper uh, you mentioned like RN and CN, and I think these are kind of like lightweight models. And but I think also transformer is very important in real world applications, like uh, like language models and visual um, visual models. They all use uh, like transformer based models, and I think it's maybe a little hard hard models and can 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 this mensa to accelerate transformers yeah so we don't necessarily evaluate transformers uh in the, in this one because we are just taking the models that google are using at the time that we did this but uh if you need i think the overall message here is that if you need a new a new model to be placed and the model does not is not follow one of those different layers which would probably be the case of transformers uh, then you can always insert a new append that with a new accelerator uh, that would be designed to that particular model, and the scaler would uh, take uh, care of it uh, during the execution. Uh, and then there is the question of how much you want to specialize your accelerators, right? But then this is a most uh, is, is I guess this is a more uh, a business decision that needs to be account uh, how important that part is. It is that your general accelerator framework is going to accelerate that particular model. So if, uh, if that is important for that, uh, that, uh, that your, the edge device that you are selling to accelerate trans, um, transformers, then for sure it makes sense to include it as a side accelerator uh, here, right, uh, as well. 
So you can always, my question, my, 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 my point is that you can always append the accelerator uh, with an uh, accelerator tailor for a different model. And hopefully uh, it, it, at some point you can again cluster uh, this and make this accelerator to trade other things other than the model that you just tailor it for. And if the decision, if it's worth it or not, then it uh, is, depends on how important the, the application is for, for whoever is designing it. Okay. okay, so maybe you should go to the next talk because I'm way be, uh, over my time. Um, Can you see the screen on Zoom? Okay, great. Okay, so I'm going to try to be a little bit faster now. So because I have two other talks to, to be covered today. Uh, so sorry if I speed up too much. Uh, I'm always prefer to stop me doing the presentation. Uh, again, this is an application-driven uh, design uh, that uses processing memory as a tool to accelerate a particular, uh, the, the, the problems that the application suffer from. And right here, uh, we are interested on databases, specifically hybrid transaction analytical processing database. So this is called uh, Polynesia, enabling high performance and energy efficiency, high transactional analytical databases with hardware software code design. It's really mouthful. Um, and it was presented in ICDE uh, this year. Uh, again, executive summary of the problem that we're trying to solve over here. So just to give us a context, right now it's really important for you to do real-time data analysis over some particular data. And usually what they use to do real-time data analysis in, in a part, in, in over data that's generated on the fly is what is called a hybrid transaction analytical processing or HTAP system. I'm going to explain exactly what it is next. Uh, and I, this system should have some properties that make sure that you have this real type property of the of of the of that is so important uh, for this particular class of workloads. And those three properties are uh, high data uh, data freshness and consistency, uh, pro allow workload specific optimizations, and also performance isolation. Again, we went to the field and we characterized those workloads that uh, those HTAP systems. And you see that they cannot, they stand instead of the art HTAP systems cannot meet all of those three uh, uh, properties that we desire for our, for for HTAP uh, applications. Uh, so the key idea that you have to accelerate uh, the to accelerate HTAP uh, processing uh, HTAP systems is quite similar to the Mesa. Actually, it's heterogeneity again. So now we are going to divide the system uh, into what we call processing islands. So each island here is this tailor either for transactional or to analytical. And, and we have accelerators in the middle to make sure that, they, 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 that we can have high data freshness and, uh, and, and consistency across those two uh, disjoint accelerators. Uh, what this provides us in uh, this division in processing islands uh, is uh, uh, do uh, workload specific optimizations and performance isolation uh, at low cost, basically. So uh, the key mechanism that you propose based on this key idea is called Polynesia, which is a novel hardware software cooperative design for e-memory HTAP systems. In Polynesia, you're going to implement custom algorithms and hardware to reduce the cost of data freshness and consistency. And we're also going to exploit processing memory to minimize the cost of uh, data movement, uh, mostly caused by the, the, the data freshening consistent mechanism. So uh, we compare Polynesia uh, against state-of-the-art uh, step systems. And then we see that it provides higher transaction analytical throughput, uh, one, uh, over, uh, average of 1.7 times and 3.7 times compared to state-of-the-art uh, accelerators. And also a reduction in energy consumption by almost 50% compared to the same accelerators. So again, it's the overview of the talk. Uh, I start with the introduction of the uh, HTAP systems. So uh, this whole problem is started because you want to do real-time data analysis of some particular set of data. And by real-time here, the, what I'm trying to say is 
I'm going to give examples going to clarify it better. So let's say that you have a self-driven car that is collecting a bunch of data during the, the when you are running your car or like going through the streets through all of the sensors that you are being collecting. So this, this is what we call transactional data. At the same time, your car needs to do some analysis of the data to take a decision. Uh, and not necessarily here, a decision is uh, uh, inference, uh, neural network inference. It can be something more strategic, strategic like uh, based on the traffic, I'm going to decide to go for one street or the other, right? And that decision, it um, is very, it, the, the, the quality of that decision is going to decrease over time. So this is what the real time components. So at, you need to take that decision at a given time, otherwise that decision is not, is not valid anymore or has low, uh, uh, low value value for that for that particular environment. So for this type of application, it's really critical to analyze transactions in real time doing the processing, uh, because otherwise the value of the data is going to diminish over time. And in the past, uh, the way that uh, transactional analytics were uh, analyzed was by having uh, a traditional database management system that was dedicated to transactional. And that, that uh, also a database management system, management system that was dedicated to analytics. And then data was copied back and forth between transactional analytical databases, uh, either manually or via some process that can take could take hours or days to do this data movement. And to solve this problem, what they the 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 database field have come up with is what we call a hybrid data management system, database management system or HTAP system which can do both transactionals and analytical uh, in a single database system, which is going to basically eliminate this cost of data movement, this high, this coarse grain data movement migration of data between one of the other. So ideal a hybrid transactional analytical processing system should have at least three properties. So the first one, it should allow for workload specific optimizations. Here, meaning that the type of workloads that executes transactionals and the type of workload that executes analytical, they are quite different. Uh, they have different properties and they have different needs. So uh, for you to fully provide data uh, real-time uh, uh, inference, no real-time execution time, uh, you should make sure that you apply each one of the of the optimizations to each one of those two different systems. And often those optimizations are contradictory to each other. So if you have to find a way from how to make sure that it happens. The second one is that you have to have uh, high data freshness and data consistency guarantees. This means that the analytical uh, part of your database management, system, database management system needs to see the most recent, recent version of the transactional data that was just updated to the system. At the same time, uh, ensure that the overall view of the whole system is consistent across both transaction and analytical uh, processing engines or processing uh, units. And at the same time, you have to have performance isolation. You don't want that the, the execution of analytical would uh, reduce the throughput of your transactional engine and vice versa. Uh, as you are going to uh, see next, achieving all of those three properties can be quite challenging. So I'm going to show again uh, some, uh, some uh, analysis that we did for from state-of-the-art HTAP systems that uh, corroborates with what I just said. So we, stood, we studied two major types of HTAP systems in this work, what we call a single instance uh, system, where both transactionals and analyticals are going to run in the same uh, uh, copy of the, of the data, or we are going to, uh, or, and also going to see uh, what to call a multiple instance HTAP system, where transact, each one of the engines, transactional and analytical, runs to a copy of the data or replica over here. And we observe that in the, both of those systems are not optimal. So uh, often uh, data freshness and consistent mechanisms are quite costly and can cause a reduction in throughput. And at the same time, providing performance isolation can be quite challenging when at the same time affecting uh, memory contention. So we start with the analysis of the single instance uh, HTAP systems. So uh, since in the sing sing single instance HTAP system, both analytical and transactions work on the same copy of the data, uh, we need to make sure that the data is consistent across both analytical and, and transactional uh, uh, threads or of, of, of processes. And then there are two main challenges to ensure 
uh, data consistency or not, sorry, not challenge. Two main approach to ensure data consistency in a single instance data step system. Uh, the first one is what called is snapshotting. So basically every time there is a trans transactional, uh, trans a, trans a new transaction, uh, updates in the main replica. The, the snapshotting basically copy, make a copy of the transactional data and apply the, this copy through the analytical, uh, to the analytical, uh, version, snapshot of the same data. And the other way of uh, imposing, uh, consistency is, uh, what you call multiple version consistent control or MVCC. And here we are not going to copy every single transactional and then applying the analytical. We are going to keep a timestamp version of the data. And, and every time there is a new transactional update to the main replica, we are going to include uh, in a timestamp chain uh, that that particular portion of the data has been uh, updated with transactional data. And when the analytical rep, analytical rep uh, engine wants to, uh, to do some uh, analyticals on top of the data, it basically traverses this uh, linked uh, uh, version, version, ch version change and to figure out which one of the, of the copies of the, the, of, of the timestamp has the, is the most recent one. So there are true drawbacks of, uh, there are drawbacks of employ each one of those systems. And in, in both cases, they impact uh, the overall throughput that you can achieve. So for example, uh, first we're going to talk about the drawbacks of having snapshotting. And here in this plot, uh, basically in the x-axis, we have the uh, eight step system that has very number of analytical queries and the y-axis we have the transactional throughput that you can achieve by that particular system. And then uh, we have two uh, systems that we're evaluating. Ideal system where snapshotting has zero cost and uh, the, the snapshotting, uh, the cost of doing the snapshotting itself. And we see that uh, there is a throughput loss when you do snapshotting in this system. And the throughput loss comes basically for data movement. So mem memory copy operations that are required uh, to be executed every time that you do a transaction update to, the, to, to a particular portion of the replica. So basically you do a snapshotting or copying data, right? So this is the main source of inefficiency. And likewise, we analyze the cost of uh, and doing the MVCC approach. And here again, you have the x-axis transactionals and the y-axis have the normalized uh, analytical throughput for two systems, a system that has zero cost of employing MVCC and another one that uh, has the cost of applying MVCC. And similarly, we see a drop on the throughput of analytical queries. And this is caused by uh, uh, going through uh, basically a point or chase problem. You have to go through all of those uh, timestamp uh, version chains to figure out which, the, which one is the most ver recent version of the data. And this is quite costly because the data can be, the, the, the data can be quite sparse in memory, uh, which is going to cause random memory access through, uh, to, to the system. Uh, again, we are going to check the, the proper pro problems with the other type of transaction step system, which is the multiple instance. And here, the main, the main challenge is how can you uh, guarantee uh, data freshness across the different replicas of that are going to be uh, placed in the system. And to do so, there is a process that is called uh, update propagation, which is further divided into two, uh, two steps. The first one is the update gathering and shipping. Basically, you're going to gather updates from the transactional uh, uh, replica, and then you're going to ship them to the analytical replica. And then you have to apply the updates to the analytical replica itself, which can involve some format conversions, uh, which can be quite possible to be executed. So again, we went there and then we analyzed uh, how the, the cost of, the, of this update propagation uh, process. And again, we saw some performance flaws. So here in this plot, we have um, for different ratios of updates and reads in this system, and for them, different number of, um, of analytical queries, we see the throughput of the system. And again, we have three different uh, configurations. The first one is that this whole update propagation uh, has zero cost, so this is an ideal system. Then you have uh, the one that does only update gathering and shipping, and the other one that does only update, the, the complete update propagation uh, process. And then we see a transaction a reduction in transactional throughput by 21.2 times, uh, per, to, to 21.2 percent doing the update propagation uh, process, and a further uh, loss in throughput of 60, 64.2 times uh, 
uh, doing the entire update propagation process. So overall, to summarize the problems that we just uh, studied here, is uh, state-of-the-art systems do not uh, achieve all of the three desired uh, H-step properties. And uh, uh, providing data freshness and consistency uh, is quite challenged because both of them, uh, both of those uh, mechanisms are quite data intensive and can cause a, redu a dramatic reduction in uh, transactional and analytical throughput. And also the system fails to provide performance isolation, mostly because of high memory contention at the memory system. So our goal basically is to take advantage of custom algorithms and hardware designs and process memory to alleviate all of those, uh, all of the challenges that are listed here or the problems that are listed here. And then I'm going to propose uh, Polynesia, which I'm going to give an overview next. So the key idea of Polynesia is to divide resources into different islands, uh, which are uh, which are can be either tailored for transactional and analytical islands. So by isolating transactional uh, uh, workloads into transactional islands and analytical workloads in analytical islands, we can apply specific uh, optimizations to each one of those islands because they are isolated. We can av avoid high main memory contention by properly designing algorithms that take advantage of this division. And also we can design efficient uh, data freshness and data consistency mechanisms without incurring the uh, high cost of data movement. And to do that, we are going to leverage processing memory uh, so we can reduce the cost of data movement in the system uh, by placing computing units nearby or inside the memory device itself. So let's see how uh, actually, uh, what are the components that we have in, in Polynesia. So basically what uh, each analytical a transactional island is going to include is going to be a replica of the data, uh, optimized execution engine, and a set of hardware resources to as that better fits the execution of transactional and analytical. And this is, I'm going, to, I'm going to give a block a diagram of what we have. So here first we have the transactional islands and the transactional islands are designed to sustain bursts of updates. And, and, and often, since transactionals often have uh, a lot of data locality, they benefit from uh, deep cache hierarchies. So for here, we only make use of conventional multi-core CPUs and multi-level uh, multi cache hierarchies uh, to make sure that we sustain high throughput for transactions. So there's no much invention here. Uh, for the analytical itself, we are going to leverage a 3D stack memory device. Uh, and you're going to place some computation and the analytical engine inside the logic layer of our 3 stack memory. So the analytical uh, engine island is designed to provide high read throughput. And to do so, it takes advantage of process memory that can allow us to mitigate data movement uh, bottlenecks in the system. And also we are going to design uh, harder to do update propagation and consistency at low cost inside our analytical engine or sorry, analytical island. So I'm going to break down each one of the components of the, um, the, of the islands next in both our uh, software implementation or software, comp uh, software components and also its hardware components. It's starting with the update propagation mechanism. So just as a reminder, the update propagation mechanism has two jobs. First, you need to gather updates from the transactional, uh, the transactional workloads and then and ship them to the analytical uh, replica. And then the update application needs to do some format conversion between uh, the, data, the transactional data and apply them to the analytical replica. So uh, in overall, uh, in the, in a, in a state-of-the-art H-step system, the update gathering shipping had three major steps. So as I said, it's going to uh, first scan and merge uh, the updates, uh, the transactional updates, and then you are going to find uh, what the target uh, column in the analytical replica that this update needs to be applied to. And then you're going to finally transfer the updates to the analytical replica. So first is gathering, uh, and then is shipping the updates to the, to the analytical replica. Uh, I'm not going to enter in details uh, on the, each one of those steps here, uh, but what you need to is important to know is that uh, they find the target column that you need to apply the updates and then transferring the, the data to the analytical replica uh, incurs large amount of data movement and, uh, incurs, and, and account for the majority of the execution time of this uh, standard algorithm that you use for update gathering shipping. 
So to solve this issue, we propose a new hardware unit to accelerate that algorithm and avoid those uh, two bottlenecks that I mean, sorry, that I mentioned before. So basically our hardware unit is going to be tailored for each one of those three steps that I showed before. We are going to have a merge uh, hardware unit here, which is composed of uh, a tree level compared to tree that can merge updates. And then we are going to have a, a hash lookup unit that is going to be designed to decouple the, the, the both the hash bucket traversal and the, and, and the, the, the hash indexing itself. Uh, which allows you to do concurrent uh, hash lookups for different uh, entries of the of the updates. And finally, we are going to have a specialized cop unit that is going to have a distributed fetch or multiple fetch and write back units uh, that again allows you to do concurrent memory access and update do the update to send the updates to the analytical uh, replica uh, faster, fully utilizing the bandwidth available for the system. Then uh, we have the other part of the update uh, propagation that is the update application, which near here we need to now, now that you have the update for a particular analytical, uh, uh, analytical replica, you need to change the format between the format that was being used for the transactional uh, replica now to the analytical replica format. So, and this is the case because usually analytical and transactionals benefit more for different formats. So if you have a, a SQL database, for example, uh, transactionals benefit for uh, row major formats, while analytical benefits more for column major formats uh, doing the inference. So now you need to take a row and basically convert, find with where the updates are and uh, change it uh, and apply it to a particular column in the anal analytical replica. And at, at the same time, the values uh, in the analytical replica are often encoded to reduce the size of the amount of, 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 of the space required to the, for the analytical replica itself. So now also we need to reconstruct, and once we have the update, we have to reconstruct the dictionary that is used for this encoding and also recompress the column again in the analytical replica. So those two major steps need to be uh, performed here in the analytical replica um, when you have a new uh, transaction update. So we are going to propose a new algorithm and also a harder to support this algorithm that take the, so both algorithm and harder takes into account the process memory logic that we're uh, using in, in the analytical uh, island. So the first step so in the algorithm in a really high level view is to build a new dictionary based on a given update and then create a, a indexing of the new updates to this new dictionary. And, um, at the same time, what is mainly different with this update is that we are going to maintain the hash index that was previously used and then only encode the new, uh, uh, new value and then find the diff of one and the other and then apply it. Uh, and then this is going to avoid us to have to compress and decompress the whole column, uh, which uh, would cause uh, late uh, data movement and random access to DRAM. And finally, we are going to recompress uh, the data using the old value encoded and the new value encoded uh, to the, this new uh, dictionary. So again, it's quite a high level view of the algorithm. And the hardware design that we are going to do to support this design is quite similar to the other one. Here, we're going to have a sort units because we need to sort the values that was uh, that was uh, encoded in the previous dictionary. And this sorter unit is basically a Byton sorter. And we use a Byton sorter because Byton sorters are quite efficient in hardware itself. And then you have again a hash unit that allows you to have check the old and the new dictionaries quickly. Uh, and then a merge unit is, which is again a comparator of trees similar to what I provoked before, uh, showed before. Then uh, basically uh, going to merge the old dictionary and the new created dictionary. Uh, is there any questions? So I'm going super fast because of, of time limitations, but if you have any question, feel free to stop me at any time. So then the consistency mechanism that you have in this in Polynesia, again, we're going to have a, a, a algorithm. So here for each column, we are going to mix both snapshotting and MVCC together. So for each column, we are going to have a change of snapshots. So it's not going to be a snapshot for the, um, like, like before, only snapshotting of the entire thing. So for every uh, column, we're going to have a change of, 
of the of the of the column where each uh, entry corresponds to a version of that column that was given. So the, basically the difference between one and the other is that the granularity is much larger here, which uh, require less uh, uh, movement of data. Um, so we are not going to create a snapshot for every time a column is updated. Uh, instead, basically you're going to have a dirty bit for a column and only when this dirty bit uh, is set, we are going to create a snapshot for that particular uh, um, for that particular column. Um, so yeah, so unlikely MVC, each version is associated with a column, not with a row. Uh, again, you're going to have a hardware accelerator to minimize the cost of doing this, uh, of this snapshotting. And basically with our accelerator is a copy unit because you need to copy, you need to copy the snapshot. So it's basically a copy unit that resembles the first copy unit that I said I showed uh, with you guys before. And, and this is right. We have multiple fetch and write back uh, units that allows for concurrent memory accesses, uh, tracking buffer to track outstanding reads and writes, so memory requests can go out of order, and a hash index that is going to to track all each one of uh, which reads and writes are co being concurrently executed. So finally, the analytical engine design. So the goal of the analytical engine is to efficiently execute uh, the queries. And to efficiently execute analytical queries, this is going to depend on the data layout and the data placement that you, uh, you, you use in the analytical uh, replica, uh, a test scattering policy that you're going to use to execute queries, and how physical operators are being uh, physically executed by the hardware design itself. So uh, we see that all of these highly benefit from processing memory, and without... Uh, a process memory aware data placement test scheduler uh, or process memory logic can be suboptimal. So we are going to design uh, each one of those three that takes into account the properties of the process memory system. And here I'm going to give a overlook of how we do the data layout and data placement. So what's the problem? The problem is have an analytical replica and this analytical replica have uh, many uh, different columns that needs to be placed inside your 3D stack memory device. Um, so there, there are uh, the, at least two intuitive ways of doing that and the way that you propose. So basically the problem here is what we call interval communication. So when you have a 2D stack memory, uh, each, uh, the memory is segmented into a uh, vault. So each vault has access to some particular banks. You can think about a vault as a memory channel in your 2D memory. And if you need to access data, uh, uh, that is, uh, is a pin core needs to access data that is not in, in its own partition or in its own vault, it needs to go to an interconnect network, which is going to incur extra uh, um, uh, latency to the memory request and fetch the data. And this can be suboptimal. So the first idea is to, is to, to place each one of the columns in a single vault. Uh, the main problem if you have this is that this is going to limit the, the so each vault as well have a limited amount of budget in terms of area and power that it can consume and also the amount of bandwidth that you're going to have for that particular vault. So if you do that, the, if you do this uh, local uh, partitioning, the, the pin core in vault one only is going to have limit access uh, of the overall bandwidth of your memory system. So basically the only the bandwidth for this particular vault and also the area of to execute the, 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 the first column here is going to be limited for the area budget for this particular vault. The other thing that you can do is to distribute. You can distribute the all columns across all of the vaults. And the problem that you have here now is that uh, this can create a bunch of overheads due to communication across those vaults back and forth. So what you propose is a hybrid approach where we call we create these vault groups uh, and then we distributed the columns across these vault groups. So this allows you to do the best, is a, is a compromise uh, between the, the two approaches uh, we, where each vault group can achieve higher, uh, can have a higher aggregated bandwidth uh, at the same time and also at the same time have higher uh, our power and uh, area budget for the uh, processing memory logic inside the that particular vault group. 
Uh, there are other details in the paper about how we execute the queries and how you do task scheduling. And for that, we better check the paper. So really briefly, uh, the evaluation. So we uh, we use previous proposed uh, HTAP systems and, and then we simulate that in Gen5. And then we compare Polynesia against uh, five, five different baselines. So it's a single instance and multiple instance baselines and ideal system. I'm going to go through this really quickly because uh, I was called up on my time. But basically here I have the number of transactionals and the transactional throughput. And then here, uh, number of transactional and analytical throughput for different configurations. And the, main, the, 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 the takeaway that I want to make here is that Polynesia comes across, comes within 8.4% of the ideal uh, system because of the custom process memory logic and and that reduces memory contention and data freshness. And likewise, uh, it also provides six uh, improves uh, the overall throughput of analytical uh, queries to by six almost sixty four percent compared to the, uh, the to the to the best state of the art one. Again, because of their custom hardware and and software design. Uh, overall, Polynesia achieves all of the three step properties of. Uh, that we are aiming for while, while providing high transaction analytical throughput compared to over prior state-of-the-art step systems. Uh, also have uh, 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 area uh, energy analysis here, and you can see that Polynesia uh, consumes 0.4 times, 0.38 times, and 0.5 times the energy compared to the previous state-of-the-art uh, solutions. Uh, basically because we can eliminate a large fraction of, of cheap DRAM accesses. So we, again, are pretty energy efficiency, efficient. So there are much more in the paper. There's real workload analysis, effect of the update propagation techniques and consistency and, uh, and mechanisms, or analytical engine design, data, how we change when increase the data size, the data size and the area analysis, and all of that in the paper. And as a conclusion, so the problem that we're trying to solve in this paper is that even though HTAP systems, hybrid transaction analytical processing systems are being more popular right now due to the need to perform real-time data analysis, they cannot achieve all of the three desired HTAP properties. And to solve this problem, we have this key idea to dividing the system into uh, different islands, uh, one for analytical and another one for transactional. And based on that, we design Polynesia, uh, which leverage uh, uh, custom algorithms and hardware and also processing memory uh, um, techniques to accelerate each step systems. And then Polynesia compared to state-of-the-art systems can uh, have higher can have higher transaction and analytical throughput at the same time having a reduction in uh, energy consumption. And that was really fast. And thanks so much for everyone for listening. Is there any question that I can take it? In YouTube and Zoom. Okay. Is there any question here? No question. So thanks everyone for listening. And I guess now we're going to go for the next uh, talk. Should should we take a break, Mohammed, or should we go straight? We have time. Okay. <laughs> Which one? Yeah, I guess while uh, you're transitioning, uh, can, you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I assume you're transitioning to the next talk since you're running late or are you taking a yes, break? Yes, I'm, I'm transitioning. Nisa is, is preparing. Her. Okay. Okay. Maybe I'll make a quick comments on the two talks that Geraldo delivered. Uh, these are actually interesting uh, hardware software co-design works. Uh, for two completely different applications. Uh, one is neural networks, clearly neural network inference in particular, and the other is for databases, hybrid transactional and analytical database in particular. And you can see that uh, higher efficiency and higher performance at the same time is possible in different domains uh, if you actually uh, co-optimize both the hardware and the software. So in that sense, I think these are actually quite nice and forward-looking works. 
uh, they're also similar in the sense that they combine both compute-centric and data-centric accelerators, designs, uh, so that you can take advantage of both, best of both worlds, if you will. Uh, some parts of the neural networks benefit from being compute-centric. Many other parts benefit from being data-centric and more specialized, customized data flows. And it's the job of the scheduler uh, to determine what benefits from what and schedule appropriately. And that's true for uh, the second work also, Polynesia. So I think uh, there's a lot uh, common in these two works, even though the designs and application domains are in the end completely different. Uh, so it's good to consider this uh, going into the future. Uh, as we've been looking in this course a lot into memory-centric, data-centric data systems, uh, not everything can be uh, accomplished uh, best uh, on the memory side. So you might actually need a very powerful uh, CPU as these works uh, show. So in the end, uh, what we have discussed in more recent lectures, like heterogeneity in the last lecture, uh, again, becomes uh, very important as you can see in these works. Okay, I won't have, uh, I won't take much more time since we're already running late, uh, but thanks Geraldo for the presentations. If people are interested in asking questions, uh, they can reach out to Geraldo, right? Yes, you can always send me an email and hopefully I reply at some point. Okay, the sooner the better. <laughs> Both for sending the email and, and the reply. <laughs> okay, uh, I think next, uh, if you over there decided not to take a break, I will introduce Nisa. Nisa is a PhD student in my group uh, and she's going to present end-to-end -end system design for two random number generators, DRAM-based. Uh, true random number generators. We have talked about uh, DRAM-based true random number generators in uh, earlier lectures, as well as uh, in, a, in a research talk on Quark TRNG. And Nisa actually looked at some system level issues that affect essentially all such types of uh, true random number generators that gen gen generate random numbers in DRAM and uh, designed end-to-end -end mechanisms to, let's say, make them work end-to-end uh, -end in a real system. So Nisa, please go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you, Omar. Uh, I'm guessing you're, you can hear me. So today I'm going to talk about our HPC 2022 paper, uh, Dr. Strange, and to system design for DRAM based to random number generators. I will first begin with a brief overview. Uh, random numbers are important for many applications, including security applications. And DRAM-based true random number generators uh, can provide true random numbers at low cost on a wide range of computing systems. However, no prior work on DRAM-based changes provides an end-to-end -end system design to enable these mechanisms in real systems. We identify three key challenges for using DRAM-based changes in current systems. As DRAM is used as main memory, random number generation uh, in DRAM creates an interference between regular memory requests and RNG requests, which we call the RNG interference. And this can degrade the system, fair, uh, system performance by slowing down concurrently running applications. This energy interference can cause unfair prioritization of applications that intensively use random numbers, which are called RNG applications, and degrade system fairness. And due to the high latency of DRAM based energies, energy applications can experience significant slowdowns. Our goal is to design an end time system for DRAM based energies with low cost and high performance. To this end, we propose Dr. Strange, an end-to-end system designed for DRAM-based ARNGs that uh, reduces the ARNG interference by separating ARNG requests from regular requests in the memory controller, improves fairness across applications with an ARNG-aware memory request scheduler, hides the large TNG latencies using a random number buffering mechanism with a new DRAM idleness predictor. Based on our evaluations, we show that Dr. Strange improves the average performance of non-ARNG and ARNG applications by 17.9% and 25% respectively. It improves their system fairness by 32% when generating random numbers at a five gigabits per second throughput, and it reduces the average energy consumption by 21%. I'll start with a brief DRAM background. Here, I show a system with a CPU and a DRAM module with several DRAM chips. Each DRAM chip consists of multiple DRAM bags, and the, these DRAM bags are accessed through one chip I.O. DRAM cells are organized as a two-dimensional array within uh, each bank, and a DRAM cell stores a single bit of information as electrical charge. To access a DRAM cell, uh, its row is activated by fetching the data stored in the cell to the row buffer, 
and the request starts faster if the row is already in the row buffer. The memory request scheduler decides which request uh, to schedule based on the current status of the DRAM. So commonly used memory request schedulers aim to maximize throughput by leveraging the row buffer. They prioritize requests to open rows over all other requests and then all the requests to, uh, over the younger ones. Here I show a request scheduler with requests uh, ordered in the age order from two different applications. And in the beginning, no targeted rows. Uh, row first schedules the oldest request uh, and brings row one to the row buffer. Other read requests to row one can be served quickly since the row is already open. Therefore, the scheduler schedules them next. Then since there are no other requests to row one, uh, it schedules the oldest request, which is a read to row three. Then uh, it continues to schedule in the same order. Let's continue with the motivation. True random numbers are used in many real world applications and the quality of the random number is especially important for a wide range of security applications, such as cryptographic key generation, authentication, and countermeasures against hardware attacks. Emergent security protocols such as quantum key distribution protocols provide stronger security guarantees uh, against attacks that target uh, weak random numbers. And these protocols require uh, higher random number throughput in the order of several gigabits per second. Other use cases of true random numbers include randomized algorithms, scientific simulation, and statistical sampling. True random numbers are only generated uh, by sampling random physical processes such as thermal noise, clock jitter, and Brownian motion. Systems can generate true random numbers with dedicated hardware true random number generators by sampling non-deterministic non various physical phenomena. However, dedicated hardware changes cannot be easily used in all systems, for example, embedded systems and processing in memory architectures. In contrast, DRAM is widely available in most computing systems and can be integrated into mobile and IoT devices as main memory. Therefore, high throughput DRAM based changes have the main advantage of availability over other changes that typically require dedicated hardware. And they can enable true random number generation within widely available DRAM chips. Next, we will look at the entropy sources within DRAM that can be used to generate random numbers. Previous research proposes a set of DRAM-based energies that leverage the randomness in retention failures, which uses random errors in DRAM cells due to uh, charge leakage in the cell's capacitor, startup values that form after power cycles, and timing failures that uses errors to, uh, due to violating DRAM timing parameters. Retention failure and startup value-based ranges have limited throughput since charge leakage is fundamentally slow and uh, power cycles are expensive. However, random DRAM timing failures can be induced quickly using carefully engineered and timed valid sequences of DRAM commands on community DRAM devices. Therefore, they provide random numbers at high throughput with low latency and they can be used in a streaming manner unlike other mechanisms. However, none of the prior work proposes an end time system design to enable these mechanisms in real systems. We identify three key challenges for integrating DRAM based ARNGs into a baseline ARNG oblivious real system ARNG interference, unfair prioritization, and high tier ARNG latency. Let's talk about the ARNG interference. True random number generation in DRAM is time consuming it can, and it can be very intrusive in a system that uses DRAM as main memory. Let's look at uh, memory request scheduling timelines of non-RNG and RNG applications when executed alone, and the timeline where they are executed concurrently uh, on a system that uses DRAM-based TRNGs. So this is the execution time of the non-RNG application, and when it runs concurrently with an RNG application, you can see each memory request gets delayed and the application execution time increases. And for the RNG application, the interference increases its execution time as well, and this shows that the ING interference incurs significant slowdowns for both types of applications. Next is unfair prioritization of ING applications. So in a perfectly fair system, no application experiences more slowdown than others when multiple applications run concurrently. However, in a system that generates random numbers in DRAM, memory request schedulers can prioritize ING applications to achieve high throughput. And by doing so, the scheduler delays non-RNG applications memory requests more than the RNG request, and this creates unfairness. Here we show the memory request of two applications, one non-RNG and one RNG application, and uh, the scheduler can prioritize RNG applications for two main reasons. First, TRNG requires multiple DRAM accesses, so each random number request is translated into multiple 
uh, memory requests. And second, NG applications can have higher quality NG uh, throughput, which results in more memory requests. So this results in NG requests being scheduled more frequently to increase the overall throughput and higher memory stall times for regular memory requests. This can increase the memory stall time of non-energy applications and degrade system fairness. And the third challenge is the high TNG latency. DRM-based true random number generation has high latency and can degrade the performance of applications that uh, require a lot of number, random numbers. Here I show a code block from an NG application and it consists of three main parts. The first one is the part of the code that does not depend on a random value. And the second one is where it uh, requests a random value. And the third uh, block, we see that some uh, instructions that depend on the generated random number. And here is the uh, memory request timeline of this application. After the unrelated code block, DRAM generates a random number to start the application's request. And this takes some time. Meanwhile, requests that depend on the random value are delayed and after the range is completed, DRAM serves the memory request from the call block that depends on the random value. As TNG is time consuming, range applications suffer from long memory stall times due to the high TNG latency. Our goal is to design an end-to-end -end system for DRAM-based TNGs with low cost and high performance that minimizes the slowdown of both ING and non ng applications, improves system fairness, and mitigates the performance degradation of uh, ING applications due to the high latency of DRAM-based TNGs. Let's look into our mechanism, Dr. Strange. Dr. Strange consists of three main components tackling three key challenges. The first component is random number buffering mechanism. It predicts and utilizes idle DRAM periods uh, to generate random numbers and stores the generated random numbers in a buffer to be served to upcoming random number requests. Uh, the random number buffering mechanism serves ING requests with low latency. The second component is the ING aware memory request scheduler. It accumulates ING and regular memory requests in separate scheduler queues. And it schedules requests based on the priority level set by the OS. ING aware scheduling reduces the ING interference and improves system fairness. The third component is the application interface. It exposes the secure interface to applications that use random numbers. And this uh, completes the end-to-end -end system design and ensures security. I will explain how random number buffering mechanism works next. Random number buffering mechanism generates and stores random numbers before they are requested to be served in the future with low latency. It predicts DRAM idleness to generate random numbers with low overhead and stores them in a secure buffer. The key question is, when do we generate random numbers? We need to generate random numbers before they are requested to uh, hide the high TNG latency and reduce the energy interference. We propose a mechanism that takes two key metrics into account to decide when to generate random numbers for the random number buffer. The first one is the low uh, utilization, low DRAM utilization metric, and it shows if a channel is not fully utilized due to the low rate of memory accesses. And the second one is the DRAM idle period length, and this shows whether the channel will be idle long enough to generate random numbers with no overhead. I will first uh, explain the first metric. Uh, we determine if a channel has low utilization based on the number of queued memory requests in the memory request schedule. Memory request schedule. Uh, this gives us an estimate of how busy the channel will be in the next cycles. And um, the random number buffering mechanism determines if a channel has low utilization by first checking the um, number of requests in the queue and comparing it to a threshold called the low utilization threshold. After the channel is determined to have low utilization, we use the second metric to decide whether to generate random numbers or to wait. For the second metric, we first need to talk about the RAM idleness. Applications often do not fully utilize the DRAM bandwidth, and this creates some idle periods. Lengths of these idle periods differ between applications based on the application's memory access pattern, and we can categorize these idle periods into two classes based, based on their lengths. Uh, DRAM idle period length metric is used to determine if a channel will be idle long enough to generate channel numbers without any overhead in the near future, and uh, it helps the mechanism to avoid short idle periods. At runtime, it is not possible to know the exact number of cycles that the channel will be idle for. Therefore, therefore, we need to predict the future based on the observed memory access pattern. So the key idea of our DRAM idleness predictor is to use the last access memory addresses to predict the length of the idle periods. 
We propose correlating memory access patterns with memory addresses that are followed by long idle periods. If a request to certain memory addresses frequently followed by long idle periods, this can point out to certain memory access patterns, like a regular memory access is leveraging the cache hierarchy. And then there is a good chance that in the future, the same address will be followed by a long idle period again. So our predictor recalls this uh, address that precedes long idle period and starts to generate random numbers after that address is accessed again. The RM idleness predictor is a lightweight predictor and it's, it is based on a predictor table of two bit saturating counters. It uses the last accessed memory addresses to predict the idle period lengths. It also maintains the counter to keep track of the length of the current idle period. The prediction mechanism works as follows. First, if a channel is idle, it accesses the predictor counter with the last accessed memory address value. Second, the prediction is determined as short or long uh, based on the counter state. And finally, we increment the idle period length counter as long as the channel stays idle. The update process is as follows. Uh, first, we, when a new memory request is received, the predictor uh, first gets the last access memory address value. It then checks the period length and compares it to a threshold that is called the period threshold and determines whether the past idle period was short or long. Third, it accesses the predictor table with the last access memory address and updates the counter uh, value based on our evaluation of the current idle period. After the entry is updated, the last access memory address is updated with the new request address and the idle period length is reset to zero. To sum up these two metrics and how to use them, our random number buffering mechanism works as follows. The mechanism first determines if a channel has low utilization by observing the memory request scheduler queues. Then if a channel has low utilization, the mechanism gets a prediction for, from the idleness predictor. If the predictor predicts idle period to be a long one, uh, then we start to generate random numbers for the buffer. When enough bits are gathered, it stores the generated random bits uh, in our buffer in the, in, you can see in here. Okay. So this way, a random number buffering mechanism generates random numbers only if the RM is not fully utilized and the idle period is predicted to be a long idle period. Now I will describe Dr. Strange's second major mechanism, ANG aware memory request scheduler. The ANG aware scheduler's goal is to schedule ANG requests without significantly stalling regular memory requests. There are two main issues with the prior ANG oblivious, me uh, ANG oblivious scheduling mechanisms. First, ING requests block regular memory requests due to the shared scheduler queue space. And second, the memory controller frequently switches in between uh, serving ING and regular re memory requests due to the ING oblivious scheduling decisions. So we create our design based on two key ideas to solve these problems. The first idea is to accumulate ING requests in a separate scheduler queue to reduce the contention for queue space between two types of uh, requests. And the second idea is to use application prior to levels to schedule ANG and regular memory requests with sw switching in between less frequently. Let's first talk about accumulating ANG requests in a separate scheduler queue. Without an ANG ever design, the requests are enqueued either to the right uh, request queue or to the read request queue. And although ING requests have different timing parameters, they perform read operations. And because of that, they are enqueued to the read request queue. This can cause regular memory requests to be blocked by the ING request as they share the queue space. Our design creates a separate scheduler queue for ING requests uh, with the observation that there are essentially different types of uh, requests. By creating a separate scheduler uh, ING scheduler queue, uh, our scheduler reduces the contention in the read request queue. This way, uh, more regular memory requests can be enqueued to the read request queue. And the second idea of the ING aware scheduler is to use the application prior to levels to schedule ING and regular memory requests. The operating system manages shared hardware resources based on application prior to levels. And ING aware scheduler can also use these priority levels set by the OS, and it can identify applications that use TNGs by observing the differences in between ING and regular memory requests. After that, ING aware scheduler can prioritize different <coughs> requests based on uh, the priority levels. There are three possible cases regarding the different priority levels. So, first, 
If an energy application with an energy request has higher uh, priority than any other application, energy ever scheduler prioritizes the energy uh, queue. This way, it can minimize the memory stall time of energy applications. Second, uh, if a non energy application with a request has higher priority than other applications, RNG Ever Scheduler prioritizes the read request queue and it minimizes non energy applications' memory stall times. And finally, if an energy application with a request has the same priority as a non energy application with a request, then the RNG Ever Scheduler prioritizes the RNG queue uh, and quickly serves the RNG request. This way, it can minimize the interference in between and improve system performance. By employing these rules, ING Ever Scheduler reduces the memory stall times of applications and improves system fairness. And the third component of Dr. Strange is the application interface. Applications use existing yet random system call, which is modified to support DRAM based ENGs and communicate with Dr. Strange. If there, if there are enough bits in the random number buffer, Dr. Strange quickly serves the request uh, from the random number buffer with low latency. Otherwise, it will generate random numbers with low RNG interference and serve the request. I will share the key evaluation results next if there are no Anissa, questions. Anissa? Yes. Before you go on to evaluation, we have a question on YouTube. So, um, so Dr. Strange relies on lowly utilized channels uh, to generate random numbers. So the question is, does this prevent uh, someone performing raw hammer attack to uh, bias the random number generation. Okay, uh, that's a complicated question, I think. So uh, if I understand, understood that co correctly, so this relies on uh, idle channels and if what happens if we do raw hammer and that would somehow affect random numbers? So I think the assumption here is uh, when the channel is lowly utilized, mm -hmm. Uh, there's a there's a lower chance of uh, a raw hammer attack going on in that channel. I think. I mean that that's the assumption in the question. Okay. Um, right. So that means I, I don't I don't I don't think I understood the question. So if you don't have a raw hammer attack, then this means that the channel is idle. Let's say or like. Uh, if that assumption is that, then we can generate random numbers. That's it. I don't know. <laughs> so I, I think it's also worth noting that, you know, uh, it, it, it's maybe we need to define like what is a low utilization, right? Okay. Um, and uh, maybe uh, while performing a raw hammer attack, you don't actually need to fully utilize the memory channel and I don't know. <laughs> so what we de define as low utilization of the channel, uh, we check the uh, request scheduler queues. And um, let's say that we have like 32 entry scheduler queue. Uh, what we used is like, we checked if the number of requests were like less than four. So I doubt that you would be able to do raw hammer uh, with that, uh, I mean, you wouldn't be able to keep the number of requests that low uh, for a long time to also like uh, train the predictor and uh, generate random numbers, right? So that's our assumption of low utilization, basically. Well, I think, uh, I think there is another answer to question, uh, which is uh, really uh, how the way how these DRMM number generators work, right? At least uh, D range, for example, which was published at HPCA 2019, uh, that uh, allocates buffer rows around the rows that you use for random number generation, so that the rows that are used for random number generation are shielded from problems like row hammer or some sort of interference, right? So I think the design of the DRM random number generators usually take this into account. That's that's one answer I would uh, give to the question. But the other answer is really raw hammer should be sold in some other way. <laughs> so raw hammer really uh, is affecting any sort of DRAM operation today, and it should be sold uh, so that DRAM operation, reliable uh, DRAM operation, including true random number generation is not affected. 
And there are solutions out there, even though they may be expensive. That makes sense, right, Nisa? Yes, I think so. OK. Okay. I think we have another question. So there is another question on YouTube, but it's it's really hard to understand. Uh, I'll just ask the questioner to rephrase it. Okay. <laughs> okay. And then uh, let's see the key evaluation results. So we evaluate performance, fairness, energy efficiency, and area overhead of Dr. Strange. Uh, we conduct cycle level simulations using Remulator and DRAM power. We simulate a realistic system with the configurations given in the slide. Uh, for Dr. Strange, we use a 32 entry random read queue and our engineer scheduler, a 256 entry predictor table per channel, and 16 entry random number buffer. We show Dr. Strange benefits using D range and clock TRNG as the RNG mechanisms used in the system. For our single core evaluations, we used uh, 43 single core applications from four different benchmark suites. We created synthetic RNG benchmarks with very required TRNG throughputs. And for multi core workloads, we created two for uh, eight and 16 core workloads by randomly choosing multiple non RNG applications and one RNG application. We compare Dr. Strange. Uh, we compare Dr. Strange to two system designs. First, we evaluate the RNG Oblivious baseline design, and second, a greedy idle design. The greedy idle design is based on the idea of a perfect DRM idleness predictor, uh, which means that if an idle period reaches the tre period threshold, uh, we assume that the uh, design can generate random numbers with no overhead. To simulate a fair comparison point, we also employ application priority based RNG aware scheduling. To evaluate RNG aware memory request scheduler, we use two comparison points. The first one is a commonly employed memory request scheduler, FRFCFS with column cap of 16. And the second is, uh, comparison point is the state of the art application aware uh, memory request scheduler, BLIS, which uses a blacklisting method to improve fairness. We compare the dual core performance of RNG Oblivious baseline design, the grid idle design, and Dr. Strange. We show the slowdown or slowdowns of non-RNG and RNG applications and workloads executed on a dual core system compared to the performance of each application uh, when executed alone on a single core. Dr. Strange reduces the execution time of non-RNG applications by 17.9% and RNG applications by 25%. It also improves the average performance of RNG applications by 20% compared to the performance of RNG applications executed alone on a single core due to the lower TRNG latency. We conclude that Dr. Strange improves the performance of both non-RNG and RNG applications. Mm -hmm. It also outperforms both baseline designs by leveraging the idle and low utilization periods to generate random numbers. We evaluate Dr. Strange with four, uh, eight, and 16 cores and show similar results to dual core evaluation results. We conclude that Dr. Strange outperforms both RNG Oblivious and Greedy Idle design significantly, and the performance improvement increases with the number of memory intensive applications in the workload mix. We compare the system fairness of the RNG Oblivious baseline, the Greedy Idle design, and Dr. Strange, and uh, Dr. Strange improves system fairness by 32% compared to the RNG Oblivious uh, design. We conclude that Dr. Strange outperforms both designs on average by employing an RNG aware scheduling policy and effectively reducing and controlling the RNG interference. To show the impact of the memory request scheduling, we compare FRFCFS, BLIS, and RNG aware scheduler. We show the performance results of non RNG applications on top, RNG apl applications in the middle, and unfairness indices on the bottom subplot. We show that RNG aware scheduler outperforms both scheduler designs and it improves their system fairness by 16%. We evaluate uh, area overhead of Dr. Strange using cacti and show that Dr. Strange incurs minor area overhead compared to an Intel Cascade Lake CPU core. And we also evaluate the energy consumption of the mechanism using DRAM power and show that Dr. Strange reduces the average energy consumption by 21%. Here's the list of other analysis and results in our paper. We discuss the security of Dr. Strange and show that the random numbers stored in the random number buffer are secure, secure because they are only accessed with a system call and the bits are just discarded after they are used. 
We discussed the round number buffer as a timing side channel and conclude that Dr. Strange side channels are likely to be more difficult to exploit than timing side channels uh, from other shared hardware structures. We discussed the random number buffer as a cover channel and conclude that countermeasures against uh, cover channels such as partitioning can be applied to the random number buffer. We discussed the denial of service attacks based on RNG requests and conclude that RNG where schedulers rules can prevent such attacks. And in addition, it is also possible to mitigate such attacks with OS level um, countermeasures. And here is the list of uh, other results that you can find in our paper. We evaluate the impact of, DR, of the DRAM idleness predictor and compare the accuracy of different predictor mechanisms. We also use the Q-learning-based reinforcement learning agent to predict the DRAM idleness by defining the DRAM idleness uh, problem as a reinforcement learning problem. We conclude that our lightweight predictor achieves similar accuracy and performance results to the ARA-based uh, predictor with incurrent less area overhead. Our RL-based predictor design is described in the paper. For more detail, um, please see the paper. And we show the performance impact of the random number buffer with different sizes and conclude that a small uh, buffer consisting of 16 entries uh, improve uh, performance significantly. We evaluate the impact of priority-based scheduling and low utilization prediction. We evaluate Dr. Strange with a DRAM-based TNG mechanism with a higher throughput quark TNG and show that Dr. Strange improves performance and fairness over the baseline, regardless of the DRAM-based TNG that is used in the system. We also evaluate workloads with RNG applications with low required TNG throughput and show that Dr. Strange improves performance of these workloads as well. For more analysis and results, I invite you to read our paper. And now let me conclude. This paper tackles three key challenges for using DRAM-based TNGs in real systems. Uh, the TNG, the ING interference that significantly slows down concurrent running applications, unfair prioritization of ING applications that degrades system fairness, and the high latency of DRAM-based TNGs that degrades the performance of ING applications. The goal of this work is to design an end-to-end system, system for DRAM-based TNGs with low cost and high performance. We propose Dr. Strange, an Anton system designed for DRAM-based TNGs that reduces the RNG interference by separating RNG and regular re requests in the memory controller, improves fairness across applications with an RNG aware memory request scheduler, highs the large TNG latencies using a random number buffering mechanism combined with a new DRAM idleness predictor. Based on our evaluations, we show that Dr. Strange improves the average performance of non-RNG and RNG applications by 17.9% and 25% respectively, it improves the average system fairness by 32% when generating random numbers at a 5 gigabits per second throughput, and it reduces average energy consumption by 21%. And that concludes my talk. Thank you for your time and attention. I can get more questions. There's one more. Okay. Have you evaluated the random numbers generated against an industry? standard random number generation benchmark like the diehard test suites i guess this question depends on the back end it's like how do you do the random number generation it doesn't depend on the system level implications but you can answer it yeah um that's true uh, this is kind of related to the dram based tng that is used in the system uh which was not so we did not propose a new way of generating random numbers, but we proposed a way of integrating these mechanisms to uh, real systems and how to use them in our systems with like low uh, performance overheads. So uh, the mechanisms that we evaluated uh, use some uh, randomness tests and show that their quality of randomness is uh, basically they can generate true random numbers, let's say. So for that, I, I guess uh, we, you could also check the other papers that are also like referenced. And um, I think that would help. And also like we are not exactly depend on those mechanisms. So you can use this uh, with any DRAM based TRNG. Uh, and then, so this is like a system integration. So yeah. Okay. Any other questions? From here, maybe. Yes, no. So thanks. Okay, thanks a lot, Nisa. I suggest that we have a seven minutes break and then we can start at 3.15.
like uh, listening like <laughs> What do you mean? I should test. <laughs> ah, okay. Okay. The microphone was muted. I mean, I don't know. Okay. I guess we can start. The next talk, Girai is going to talk about understanding row hammer under reduced word line voltage, an experimental study using real DRAM devices. Gira is a PhD student in Safari Research Group, and feel free to start, Gira. Okay, thanks, Mohammed. So uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, today I'll talk about this paper. This is published in uh, uh, last uh, actually this year's uh, DSN conference. 
Uh, it's about understanding row hammer uh, when we reduce the vo voltage of the word lines. Okay, so good. So here you see a um, uh, you see a DRAM module that we use as the main memory uh, in current computing systems, and <clears throat> When we look at this DRAM module, uh, each of those black things is a DRAM chip. And within each DRAM chip, we have multiple banks. Each bank consists of multiple subarrays. And within every subarray, we have a, a two-dimensional array of DRAM cells. So these cells are accessed in a DRAM row granularity. And uh, that are driven uh, to, to access the DRAM row, you need to drive this word line with some high voltage. And once you um, assert a word line by uh, driving it with high voltage, uh, these bit lines are connect each DRAM cell to the row buffer structure over there. And then, uh, yeah, so, uh, okay, a little more information about DRAM. So within each DRAM cell, we have a capacitor, uh, a capacitor here and an access transistor there. So this, uh, when we uh, drive this work line with high voltage, we enable this access transistor and capacitor uh, stores our bit as the voltage value here. And then it connects to bit line so that we can read uh, from bit line the capacitor value or we can write it back uh, over the same access transistor. So uh, as a nominal voltage, uh, we supply the circuitry uh, with a voltage called one point, a VDD, uh, which is nominal around like 1.2 volts in uh, DDR4 uh, systems. And uh, so, okay, we we have, uh, a DRAM has this intrinsic problem of leakage, right? So we have multiple charge leakage paths and uh, these charge uh, leakage paths cause this capacitor to lose charge over time and uh, we, we need to perform this refresh operation to restore the capacitor voltage periodically with a time period called refresh window. And uh, to access a DRAM cell, as I said, we need to uh, assert the word line and activate the cell. So this operation is called row activation, which basically fetches the row's content into the row buffer. And uh, to do this operation, we basically uh, drive word line with uh, another voltage called VPP which is nominally around 2.5 volts. So as you can see, there is a significant difference between this word line voltage and the uh, other supply voltage called VDD here. Um, so when we drive word line with this, uh, so our cell is connected to row buffer, we can perform our, all column accesses to the row buffer. And then uh, once we need to access data from another DRAM row, we basically need to pre-charge the bank so that we prepare it for the next row activation. So let's talk about row hammer a little bit. Um, I think you saw this slide many times in the past, so uh, I'll uh, try uh, covering it very quickly. So uh, let's say we want to access data from row two, we need to open it. And once we are done with row two, we, we need to close it, right? So when we do this operation many times, you observe bit Phillips in uh, physically adjusted rows. And if you keep doing this, then you will observe more bit Phillips in the physically adjusted rows and more bit Phillips in other rows as well. So this is called a uh, uh, row hammer. And uh, we name this uh, row two here that we hammer as the aggressive row and the other rows as victim rows. So uh, I'll explain the same thing again in a different way here. So we will go a little bit uh, low level here to talk about the voltage levels. So uh, we have this DRAM uh, array, let's say like the, all, all these blue lines are different rows. We have the aggressive row in the middle and on top on the bottom, we have different victim rows. And initially everything is driven by the low voltage. So all the rows are closed. So you open this row and when you apply this high voltage here, it actually incurs some disturbance to the nearby rows. And uh, here in, on the right up corner, you see a, a plot where x-axis is time, or y-axis is aggressive rows, word line voltage. So uh, let's say we uh, applied this kind of uh, signal here, uh, we in induce some disturbance. And then we close it, and then we open it again, 
we disturb more, we close it, we open it again, and we disturb more, and then we can see some bit flips nearby. So actually, this tells us that repeatedly toggling the word line voltage is the key to inducing Rohammer bit flips. So this is an important uh, observation for this paper or motivate, to motivate this paper. Um, so uh, with this background and motivation, uh, I'll give an executive summary. So uh, as I said in the previous slide, repeatedly toggling the DRAM rows or line voltage causes bit flips in nearby rows. And this is uh, this what uh, makes row hammers real. Uh, and uh, this vulnerability called row hammer worsens in denser DRAM chips. And understanding row hammer is necessary for enabling effective and efficient solutions, right? Um, so we need to understand more. But there's a problem that, you know, no study in the literature actually demonstrates how the magnitude of this word line voltage affects row hammer. So we will look into this uh, in this paper. So our goal is to experimentally understand the relation between VPP, which is the word line voltage, and row hammer, and uh, the effects of changing VPP on other DRAM operations. And to this end, we basically perform an experimental study, con conduct an experimental study here using 272 DRAM chips from three major DRAM manufacturers. And we observed, we made like six observations here, uh, but I'll summarize as follows. So we observed that bitter rate caused by raw hammer attack significantly reduces when we uh, reduce uh, word line voltage. Uh, when we reduce the word line voltage, a row needs to be activated more times to induce the first bit flip. So the raw hammer vulnerability in general reduces. And uh, when we look at uh, VPP's effect on different uh, different DRAM operations. Uh, we have nine observations in the paper, but I will summarize it here. So a vast majority of the tested DRAM chips actually reliably operate using nominal timing parameters uh, when we reduce word, word line voltage. So their reliability is not uh, affected too much. And uh, a small fraction of DRAM chips actually uh, exhibit erroneous behavior but we can also make them reliably operate by using longer row activation latency, uh, like this kind of activation latencies, uh, and uh, using some singular error correcting codes or double end refresh rate for a small fraction of DRAM rows. So in conclusion, uh, we say that reducing word line voltage can reduce row hammer vulnerability without significantly affecting reliable DRAM operation. So, okay, let's move to motivation and goal. Uh, raw hammer is a, a serious problem and it gets worse uh, in, 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 over generations of DRAM chips. So on the x-axis, you can see minimum activation count to observe a bit flip. So this is, uh, so when this gets lower, it's easier to induce raw hammer bit flips. And when you look at the years on the y-axis, uh, chips from actually a study published in 2014 shows this kind of value for this uh, number of activations. And you see a more than an order of magnitude uh, reduction actually in like less than a decade. So defense uh, the chips are becoming more vulnerable and defenses are becoming prohibitively expensive at the same time uh, because of this. Uh, and we definitely need a deeper understanding of raw hammer to come up with more efficient and effective solutions. And uh, to this end, actually, this is not the first attempt. So prior works investigate how raw hammer DRAM change, uh, how raw hammer changes across different DRAM generations with technology scaling, with uh, I mean temperature, with aggressive rows active time, and uh, with uh, victim DRAM south physical location. Uh, I think next week we will we will talk about this uh, work as well. Um, but uh, although repeatedly toggling word line voltage causes raw hammer, there is no rigorous experimental study in the literature that demonstrates how the magnitude of this word line voltage affects raw hammer vulnerability in real DRAM chips. So we need to look into this. So to this end, we come up with an hypothesis. Our hypothesis says that when we reduce the word line voltage, as here. We can reduce raw hammer vulnerability without significant effect in reliable DRAM operation, which is the same sentence I, as I stated as our conclusion in the summary. So let's look into that. 
so our uh, goal here to understand how the word line voltage affects the raw hammer vulnerability and also the reliable DRAM operation in real DRAM chips. So uh, let's move into the experimental study. So we use an FPGA-based infrastructure. I think you're already familiar from the previous lectures with this infrastructure. Uh, we call it a modified version of SoftMC in this paper. And later on, we actually uh, open sourced uh, this infrastructure as, uh, with the name DRAM Bander. It's, it has its own paper. Uh, you can check that as well. So in this infrastructure, we have a power supply here. We have a DRAM, DRAM module here, uh, uh, just like uh, clamped with the heater pads that uh, controls its temperature. Uh, we, we use the temperature controller and uh, this power supply here uh, supplies the word line voltage. And this infrastructure allows us fine-grained control over DRAM commands, timing parameters, temperature, and word line voltage. So to characterize our DRAM chips for the worst case conditions, we first prevent sources of interference during the core test loop. Uh, to this end, we basically disable DRAM refresh to avoid refreshing the victim row to, uh, you know, to be able to uh, observe all the bit flips in the circuit level. Uh, we disable all the calibration events to minimize the variation and test timing because timing is important. And we disable all raw hammer mitigation mechanisms to observe circuit level effects. And um, uh, since we disable DRAM refresh, we also make sure that all of our, each of our tests uh, complete uh, within a uh, with less less than a refresh window, so around like 32 milliseconds to avoid retention failures. And uh, we repeat tests multiple times to draw conclusions and. We also use the worst case access sequence based on the prior work where we repeatedly access the two physical adjacent rows as fast as possible. And we test uh, these DRAM chips, DRAM modules from Micron, Samsung, and SK Hynix. Uh, uh, these, these have like different, uh, so yeah, we, we test 272 DDR4 DRAM chips uh, from three major manufacturers with uh, different densities, uh, dire visions, uh, chip organizations, and manufacturing dates. So you can see uh, a, a more detailed information of this uh, DRAM modules and uh, a, a detailed algorithm, actually multiple algorithms, uh, about our tests in the full paper. I'm not going to go into details. Um, so let's move on to the observations, raw hammer under reduced word line voltage. So I'll first give the takeaway and then I'll share the results. So the first takeaway says that reducing word line voltage reduces raw hammer vulnerability. And uh, when we reduce word line voltage, we observe fewer bit flips uh, as a result of raw hammer attack. And the activation count uh, to induce the bit flip increases significantly. Um, so, okay, in this plot on the x-axis, we have the word line voltage. Uh, so uh, it's increasing on the x-axis, but we will actually look at it backwards because 2.5 is the nominal voltage and we will be reducing it. And on the y-axis, we have the bit error rate as a result of our hammer attack. And obviously lower is better in this plot. So when we look at... Uh, so, okay, so uh, you see multiple curves here and each curve is colored differently based on the um, DRAM module. So e each of them represent a different DRAM module. And uh, the shades around these curves are actually showing the variation across DRAM rows in a DRAM module. So as a general trend, you can see that, okay, this laser doesn't work anymore. Uh, as a general trend, you can see that the bit error rate reduces as we reduce uh, word line voltage. And uh, if you look at that top part, uh, we can also see in some cases, we, the bit error rate can increase as well. So there's also that observation, reducing more than voltage can cause more DRAM cells to experience bit flips in, but this only happens in a small fraction of rows. So the dominant trend is decreasing. And uh, when we look at like, DRAM modules from different manufacturers, actually we see the same trend across all of them. So let's look at the word line voltage again on the x-axis and the minimum activation count to induce the first bit flip or draw hammer threshold on the y-axis. So as this 
while you get slower, it's easier to perform a row hammer attack. So in this case for us, higher is better. So higher is less vulnerable. And uh, again, different curves, different colors represent different DRAM modules and the shades around them uh, show the variation across DRAM rows. And as a general trend, we see that when we reduce the worldline voltage, this uh, row hammer threshold increases, meaning that uh, row hammer vulnerability reduces. And again, we see values lower than 1.0, uh, meaning that the minimum activation count in this first bit flip reduces in some cases. And this also happens in a very small fraction of rows. Again, when we look at uh, modules from all three manufacturers, we see the same trend and uh, we conclude that uh, row hammer vulnerability reduces. So we have more analyses regarding this in the paper. So we look at Verlan voltage effect on row hammer vulnerability, how it varies across different DRAM rows and manufacturers. And we show that both the bit error rate and the row hammer threshold changes uh, uh, across different DRAM rows and manufacturers. So you can check the full paper uh, to see the whole analysis over there to see how they change. Um, and again, the, the first takeaway is that the, we, by reducing our line voltage, we can reduce row hammer vulnerability. So, okay, we can reduce row hammer vulnerability, but this is not the whole story here, right? So we also make sure that DRAM actually can perform reliably when we reduce the wireline line voltage. So we also look at that. So um, as uh, the final piece of our hypothesis, if you remember, we said without significant effect in reliable DRAM operation. So here, if you look at like, when we, when, we, when we apply a higher voltage to a word line, it actually, if you remember from your circuits uh, classes, uh, it actually uh, forms a stronger channel in this access transistor. And when we reduce this word line voltage, the channel becomes weaker. So regarding this, we need to uh, test if any operation changes. So there are actually just a few operations that actually can be affected from this. So we will uh, be looking at them, but I'll first give two takeaways. The second takeaway in our paper uh, or first takeaway of this section is that most of the DRAM chips reliably operate using nominal timing parameters due to built-in safety margins call, as, called as uh, guard bands. And um, there's a small fraction of DRAM chips that actually uh, exhibit a, um, uh, erroneous behavior. But when we uh, operate them with longer row activation latency, we can actually uh, make them work reliably. And uh, also we look at the retention characteristics of these DRAM cells and we show that uh, most of these DRAM chips, again, reliably operate using nominal refresh rate, but uh, a small uh, amount of them uh, can exhibit erroneous behavior for those we can use singular correcting codes or we can double the refresh rate for this small fraction of DRAM rows. Okay, let's uh, look into the data. So here on the x-axis again, you see the word line voltage reducing from right to left and uh, different curves again show different DRAM modules here. And on the y-axis, we show the row activation latency. So this is the minimum uh, reliable row activation latency. So, uh, okay, different modules. And uh, the shade shows the variation across the RAM rows. It's the same story. So if you see uh, the general trend here is that when we uh, reduce word line voltage, the row activation latency increases, right? Uh, but you need to also uh, 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 note that uh, this, uh, there's this level of nominal activation latency. So. When you operate your DRAM module in, in your device, actually you use this value as your activation latency. Even though your activation completes much earlier than this, you already wait for this amount of latency. So the increase below uh, in, increase in the activation latency is not that important as long as the final value is below this uh, nominal activation latency. So we say that, most of our DRAM chips complete row activation before the nominal, law, nominal activation latency. So uh, we observe the same trend across modules from all three manufacturers. So we, can, we conclude that, okay, we can use the nominal row activation latency. 
So we observed that 48 DRAM chips from manufacturer A reliably worked with raw activation latency of 24 nanoseconds instead of uh, 13, 14 here. Uh, so you can increase the raw activation latency for only like these DRAM chips. And uh, if you look at manufacturer B, there's also 16 DRAM chips and they work with like a slightly lower, uh, slightly higher raw activation latency. And uh, it's it's important to note that um, manufacturer C, SJ Hynex, uh, all the tested chips from this manufacturer actually uh, reliably work using the nominal raw activation latency. Okay, so to, to, to understand and verify these observations or back them up with uh, some uh, circuit simulations, we also perform some high simulations in this uh, paper. So uh, we do this to provide insights into our line voltage effect on DRAM operation. Uh, we use 22 nanometer transistor model with these parameters here, and we also perform a Monte Carlo analysis with 5% variation across 10,000 iterations. Uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can see the full model in the paper. So here in this plot, we have time on the x-axis, and we look at the bit line voltage on the y-axis. And uh, we th this this plot is uh, generated by like simulating a raw activation late, uh, raw activation operation. So uh, there is a threshold voltage here that is defined by the uh, specifications. So as your bit line voltage reaches this threshold voltage, it means that your raw activation latency uh, raw activation operation is completed. So you can see for different voltage levels here for different colors you see the, um, uh, how the voltage changes across this time, right? And you can see that, um, okay, you can see that for, for the yellow one, okay, why doesn't it work? Sorry. Okay, so for this yellow one, it's like 2.5 volt, and as you go to like purple, blue, it's like going down to 1.7, right? So just check where this actually um, uh, cuts the VTH. And you can see that this, this point actually shifts to right. So bit line voltage takes longer to reach VTH here. And uh, this is because uh, the access transistor has weaker channel when we reduce the word line voltage. So the raw activation latency actually increases with reduced word line voltage. And when we look at the simulation results, actually, you, you can see as a, a result of the Monte Carlo analysis, you see like different values, a distribution of uh, row activation latency across different iterations with the variation. And uh, you see that, uh, so, okay, we marked the nominal row activation latency here as the dashed uh, black one. And uh, you see that the worst case TRCD when VPP uh, is 1.9 volts it is realized, uh, falls into this, this level. And if you check that value at 2.5 volts, it's, it's a bit lower than that, right? So uh, we observed that the guard band uh, for draw activation latency reduces from 4.4% to 1.5% for this analysis. And uh, yeah. So the worst case latency increased from 12.9 to 13.3 nanoseconds. But again, it's under the nominal uh, TRCD for this analysis. And uh, we conclude that spy simulation results agree with our observations based on real chips. So we look at, uh, also we look at the word line voltage effect on DRAM charge restoration process. Uh, I'll not go into detail about that. So the result is that a DRAM cells Capacitor voltage can saturate at a lower voltage level when word line voltage is reduced. And DRAM cell charge restoration latency also can increase with reduced word line voltage. But again, the same uh, idea when you use nominal uh, values, you have the guard band and it's mostly okay. Uh, but this is important. When the capacitor voltage saturates at a lower voltage level, now your retention time can get reduced, right? So we also look at that. Uh, and it is the last part of the paper. And the takeaway, I already show, uh, told you, so I'm just skipping that. So here we look at on the x-axis, now we, instead of voltage, we have the refresh window here. So we initialize rows and then check uh, after some time if they exhibit any retention bit flips. So here we sweep the refresh window from 64 milliseconds to 16 seconds, which is like very exaggerated here. 
And uh, on the y-axis, we look at the data retention bitter rate and different colors here show different voltage levels. Uh, okay, I already said that. And we observe that uh, as we reduce the world line voltage, more DRAM cells tend to experience data retention bit flips, as you see here. But at the same time, most of the DRAM chips reliably operate using nominal refresh rate, which is 64 milliseconds. So it's at zero here, regardless what voltage level you uh, apply, uh, due to the built in safety margins. And we observe the same trend again across three major manufacturers. Uh, okay, so we look at the special distribution of the few data retention bit flips that we observe. Uh, when there are no 60, uh, and we observe that there are no 64 bit words with more than one bit flip. What does this mean? It means that you can use a singular correcting code to actually fix all these bit flips, and you can just use uh, the nominal refresh rate with ECC support. And on this plot, we have the number of 64 bit data words with one bit flip on the x axis. So this is like a histogram. And you see like fraction of DRAM rows on the y axis. So we see like um, where these uh, erroneous uh, 64 bit data words are located within the DRAM chip. And we observe that actually a small fraction of DRAM rows contain these erroneous words. So Okay, so if, if you don't want to use singular correcting codes, then you can just um, increase the refresh rate, right? Uh, to, to actually uh, focus on these particular rows. Uh, yeah, so th this small fraction of rows on the y-axis, right? Uh, and uh, the double the refresh rate for them, them, and then you will be okay. So this is the last takeaway. To conclude, we provide the first row hammer characterization under reduced word line voltage in the study. And we exper uh, share experimental results with 272 real DRAM chips, showing that reducing word line voltage reduces row hammer vulnerability. It increases row activation latency, even though that increases OK, and uh, reduces the data retention time. But uh, uh, even though the, we observe these, we conclude that reducing world line voltage can reduce straw hammer vulnerability without significantly affecting reliable DRAM operation because we already have some uh, large guard bands to compensate for that. And this is the end of the talk, and I can take any questions. No questions? Okay. Do you have any questions? No questions. I can ask you questions. <laughs> okay. Should I? Sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, maybe uh, first I'll make a comment and then I'll ask. Uh, so, first of all, I think this sort of study is very important to do, understanding uh, different uh, interactions of Rohammer and effects of different uh, uh, let's say parameters on row hammer and there are quite a few basically and I think you're going to present another paper that you have co-led next week which appeared at micro 2021 which provides a deeper understanding of row hammer in terms of temperature uh, spatial variation and uh, row active time so this sort of studies are really important to do and uh, there should be more such studies rigorous studies uh, done so in that sense, I think it's very uh, nice work, Girai. And these are also not easy to do because there are many parameters. It's always good to verify experimental results with circuit level studies like what you have presented uh, as much as possible, of course, uh, in this paper. Uh, now, I think uh, this work is interesting. Clearly, uh, it shows that there is an effect, uh, but clearly it also shows to me that uh, word line voltage uh, is not the solution to this problem. It can help, but uh, it's not going to be the major solution. Do you agree? Yes, I agree. Because the, okay, yeah, we showed that we reduced the Rohammer vulnerability, but the, the, the rate is not uh, uh, too much, actually. So we, we, we observe uh, uh, increase in the uh, 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 Rohammer threshold by like 85.8%. Uh, as maximum, but 7.4% uh, on average. So mm -hmm. yeah, the, this this uh, uh, 
this, this uh, reduction in row hammer vulnerability is not that significant to apply this as a standalone row hammer solution, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, that, uh, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, one, one other question, uh, somewhat related is, uh, okay, this is a very specific uh, voltage, which is important for row hammer, which is word line voltage. What about other types of voltages that you input into the DRAM chip? What is the effect of those <laughs> on row hammer? Uh, yeah, so uh, I think another voltage that needs to be considered is the supply voltage. Uh, but uh, yeah, so unfortunately we didn't, we were not able to change it for this paper. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I think it is also important to uh, yeah, look into that and uh, uh, reducing or increasing supply voltage should have an effect in row hammer. So when we increase the supply voltage, we basically put more charge into the capacitor in the DRAM cell and it can actually uh, give us a more reliable uh, solution. Mm -hmm. um, and reducing that can actually uh, make the DRAM cell uh, more vulnerable to uh, leakage related error mechanisms. One is retention errors, the other one is raw hammers. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, the, the, definitely there needs to be a study to quantify this. Does okay. that make sense to you, to you? Yeah, absolutely, I agree. And yeah, that's part of future work, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then there's certainly interaction between different voltages potentially as well, right? I think that's what makes this problem a bit uh, more complicated than uh, initially uh, meets the eye, right? Because there are a lot of these interactions that you have with low level uh, circuit issues, like data pattern dependence is one that we have discussed in this course, but voltages are another one, I would say. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, are, are there any other questions in the room online? There is one. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I think the Mac is working. So uh, I feel that this is a rigorous paper with multiple testing under different scenarios across different models. But um, in the end, it is just, uh, I feel like it is just empirical study. Uh, it did not provide an explanation on like why the VPP uh, affects the, um, say, the probability of row hammer attacks, and especially the the effect of VPP um, kind of does not perform um, across rows. So um, I didn't look into the paper very detailed. So uh, did you provide any explanation on like why this is happening, or do you have like any plans for explaining? So yeah, to to actually back it up with uh, more insightful explanations, uh, there, there there is there is need for more circuit level simulations, definitely. Uh, so uh, one one challenge here is that you cannot go into the RAM chip and observe like what exactly is happening there, right? In this kind of studies, so in that sense, I uh, I understand why you say empirical, um, but we have a hypothesis in the in the uh, paper. Uh, so the idea goes like this. Uh, so when you perform row hammer, you apply high voltage, low voltage, right? And this um, uh, this uh, um, toggling in the word line voltage is causing row hammer because um, uh, so we, we, we have like uh, several uh, error mechanisms explained in the literature. Uh, showing like how row hammer happened or explaining how row hammer happens. And um, this is this is like one of the very strong explanations. When you toggle the word line voltage, uh, because of the parasitic capacitance, it affects the nearby word lines. It uh, causes them to slightly open their uh, access transistors and then you have more leakage over there. So there's an exacerbated leakage and then the row hammer happens. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, uh, with spice simulations we have in this paper, we can only look into like how the latencies change or uh, retention changes, charge restoration changes. Uh, but uh, those, those simulation, th those circuit models are actually not that comprehensive to simulate the raw hammer effect. 
And for that, uh, uh, you definitely need uh, some circuit level, like physics kind of simulations. So the, the, there are some papers doing TCAT simulations in the literature, and uh, I guess I will just refer you to those because uh, when they come up with models, there's always a component of our line voltage over there, even though you know uh, you don't have the real numbers to plug in to those models. Uh, I don't know, does that answer your question or am I missing something? <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Any other questions? Yeah, I don't have a question, but uh, I will point people to uh, a paper that we have recently written with Girai and Otaberk uh, that covers a lot of the recent research on some future directions uh, in Rovhammer. Maybe Girai can share it or I can share it. I assume Girai knows about it. <laughs> yeah, from, from yeah, but this is <laughs> yes. yeah, this is this is the paper. I don't know if you can see it online, but oh uh, wait, I need to stop sharing. Oh wait. On That's Zoom, right. probably you can see it, but uh... oops. Uh, wait a second. <laughs> I need to end presentation and uh... okay. Wait. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's now this paper. Your screen. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. I don't know if they're seeing me, but <laughs> they're seeing the screen probably, uh, or people are seeing the screen. Uh, yeah, basically, this is the paper. It's going to appear in January, uh, but it's already on archive. And if people are interested in, let's say, the cutting edge status of Rovehammer, uh, you can take a look at it. Uh, I don't know if you're seeing the paper itself. Uh, yes, we are seeing it. Okay, yeah. We also see you. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. I was not sure. Yeah. Yeah, I would suggest looking into it uh, a bit. It, it kind of gives a, a, a summary of the major developments including what's happening very recently in industry as well as academia. Uh, but also, I think it focused on two major directions, which I believe uh, this paper that Girai presented uh, today is taking a step uh, on. And also the paper he's, he's going to present next week, which is building a fundamental and comprehensive understanding of Rohammer. Basically, uh, I don't believe we completely understand everything about it uh, yet. And this is important because uh, this can effectively, uh, uh, a solution really needs to uh, be good enough. But if you don't understand an important component, for example, you may come up with a solution uh, that ignores that component. And the ignoring that component may make your solution not completely secure. Uh, so that's really important to understand. Like data pattern is one example over here. Uh, but voltage could be another example. Basically, uh, different operating conditions are uh, quite interesting examples. I think there's more work to be done uh, over here. And then the second uh, thing is uh, designing very efficient solutions. We've discussed this in this class, uh, but we really need much more efficient uh, solutions uh, to Rohammer and, uh, and also completely secure solutions at the same time. I don't think we have that combination yet in literature. And... Uh, I think the research community should be diving towards this, this type of solutions. Of course, there are other directions that are also important, like looking at other security problems, et cetera, that are not covered here because people are clearly working on them uh, a lot. But these are two directions that I believe require more attention than what has been given uh, in research at this point. Okay, maybe Girai has a comment on this, but if he doesn't, uh, I'll stop sharing. No, I, I don't have a comment, but I think. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay, cool. Maybe uh, the Skype, uh, I don't know if it's Konstantinos. Konstantinos, you can put it online also as part of one of the papers that we mentioned. If people are interested, they can find it. Okay, I think we're done. Uh, so tomorrow we have the review session. Uh, hopefully people will attend. And next week we have the uh, exam uh, and another research session after the exam. Uh, so if people are interested in research, they can certainly attend these uh, research lectures and learn more.
And I think one last comment, please, if you haven't filled out the course evaluations, please fill them out. Uh, hopefully these uh, research sessions are useful for people who are interested, but as we mentioned, none of this is required uh, uh, for, uh, for the exam. So uh, if you haven't attended the session, don't worry also. Okay, uh, take care, everyone. Thanks, Gerai. Thanks, so.